Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm really excited to have my conversation with Arvid Ugrin. Arvid is a evolutionary biologist who is interested in the causes and consequences of genomic conflicts. Uh, he studied biology at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he has his PhD in transposable element and genome size evolution from the University of Toronto. He did his postdoc at the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics at Cornell. And he was also uh, did part of his fellowship at the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard, uh, which was hosted by David Haig. And he is now a researcher at the Evolutionary Biology Center at Uppsala University, which is in Sweden. He is the author of his first book, which is called The Gene's Eye View of Evolution, which is absolutely fantastic. And it's what we talk about uh, in the conversation. I have to say this conversation was, I mean, just splendid in terms of the content. I mean, he's obviously very brilliant as you, as everyone will hear. It is probably one of the most uh, detailed and in some sections dense conversations I've had. Um, he, is, he has such a mastery of these topics and it was really exciting to really get into the details of some topics that I've talked about on the podcast before, other many people uh, have talked about and written about, but he has such a grasp on many, many of the debates, details, uh, genetics, biology, uh, when it comes to something as central to how we understand life on Earth as evolution. We start uh, the conversation by talking about his background and reasons for writing the book. We talk about the genes I view of natural selection. We talk about how one can understand evolution without genetics, but how genetics enhances our understanding of evolution. We talk about how genes are immortal. Uh, we talk about how they're selfish and how they cooperate together. We talk about adaptation and its history. We discuss some of the challenges of creationism and intelligent design. We talk about genes, chromosomes, DNA, proteins. We also mention types and tokens along with replicators and vehicles. We talk about what is a meme and how it impacts cultural evolution and how it's different from the extended phenotype. He kind of outlines for us the five difficulties of the selfish gene concept. We talk about Hamilton's rule and in inclusive fitness. We talk about the interaction of Hamilton's rule with cooperation, kin selection, and interdependence, and many other topics uh, around his book and with evolution. I have to say, his book is great because he really spends a lot of time talking about Richard Dawkins' selfish gene and, and many of the concepts that he puts forth, and then many of the other debates that have happened um, in evolutionary science for the past you know, 40 years. Uh, Arvid is a really, really nice guy. Um, very, very affable. He was, I mean, really just a joy to talk to for, you know, two and a half hours or more uh, about these topics. And um, now I bring you Arvid Ordering. I'm here with Arvid Orgren. Did I say that right? I, I hope I didn't mispronounce it too badly. S Swedish is not my first language, so you have to forgive me. <laughs> um, thank you for, for, for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I've uh, followed some of your work and I saw that you had a, a book coming out with a, a really awesome title. So that caught my eye and then I said, oh, I, I gotta read this. And so then um, I was able to read it. You're very nice to send it to me, and uh, it's brilliant. the The book is called "The Genes I View of Evolution," and uh, it's really remarkable. I, I really commend you on on writing such a really good book. It's uh, it's a lot of research, a lot of things that I can tell, and for reading went into it. So it's uh, it's really quite brilliant. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So um, okay, so I, I want to talk to you about the book and everything in it. Before we do that, just tell people a little bit uh, who you are, where you you know do your your research, and where you you teach, and uh, kind of a little bit of um, your background and all that kind of stuff. 
My name is uh, Arvid uh, Ogan. Uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist uh, by training. I'm currently a, a Vennegan Fellow, a, uh, which is a research position I first held as a postdoc at uh, Harvard. And as of uh, this fall, I've moved to uh, Uppsala University in uh, Sweden, which is also my uh, hometown, to continue that uh, fellowship. My research has centered on how the classic problems of conflict and cooperation play out at the molecular level. Mm. And I've been interested in the biology of genomic conflicts and the spread of so-called selfish genetic elements, genes that have the ability to promote their own transmission, even if it comes at the expense of other genes and or the fitness of the organism that carries them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've also been interested in the kind of the history and philosophy of these questions that uh, arise from the study of the, 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 the science of this mm-hmm. uh, and kind of combine that is what led to, to writing this uh, book. Yeah, I was going to say, I was, I was going to ask, you know, is that kind of what led you to write the book? Is Because a lot of it is very much a kind of history of how we got to the understanding of many of these concepts. And so um, was there any other motivations for, for writing the book or, or that was the primary one? That, that was a central part of it. Um, I start the book by noting that one of the biggest embarrassment, embarrassments of my life is that I'm such a poor naturalist. <laughs> and compared to many of my colleagues in, in evolutionary biology who came to the field through a love of natural history, the keen birders or, or, or botanists, I've always been rather mediocre at that. And instead, what attracted me to the field was a fascination with the the logic of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Mm. And it was kind of that fascination combined with that, uh, a realization that not everyone thinks about these issues in the same way. Mm-hmm. And uh, instrumental for me was when I moved from uh, from Scotland where I did my undergraduate training to, to mm. Canada, to Toronto, to do my PhD. And uh, I, I met uh, students and colleagues from, from the United States who had a very different perspective uh, on these issues than I did. And, uh, and that, that was a really transformative and, and fun uh, experience for me. Yeah, you, you mentioned that in the book, and I, I kind of laughed when I when I when I read that because I was like, yes, that is my experience as well, just on the opposite end. Right? In the United States, we have uh, certain um, uh, places where we put uh, kind of importance for things, rightfully or wrongfully. And uh, when I've talked to other people on the other side of the pond, they'll say, oh, oh, that's weird. We usually focus on these areas. And so it's, it's very, very um, interesting how some people will focus on certain uh, aspects on the, you know, some of the debates within evolution and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's, let's start out with, in, in terms of the book, is um, you spend a lot, of the, a lot of time talking about the selfish gene. Um, obviously, you know, the book is very much about the genes eye view of things. And so selfish gene as uh, outlined by Richard Dawkins, who I'm sure we'll talk about uh, a handful. You talk about him a lot in the book. Um, but before we kind of get to that, how do you, I think it's good to really explain, I'm really curious for your your perspective here, how do you usually explain natural selection, which is the core feature of um, evolution, and why is the genes eye view of natural selection super critical for, for understanding natural selection? In, in its original formulation, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection was a theory about individual organisms, that organisms vary in how well they survive and reproduce. And if some of those traits that cause that variance are heritable, we expect those traits to become more common as the generations uh, go by. So when we think about this, we think about individuals that struggle to survive or individuals that uh, compete uh, in order to, to gain access to, 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 to mates. The genes I view kind of puts that on its head. So instead of thinking in terms of organisms, it argues that biologists are better off thinking about evolution in t- from the perspective of individual genes. Mm. And this is a way of thinking that very much was born out of the emergence of population genetics Mm -hmm. in the 1920s and the 1930s. And population genetics, in turn, was a union between, on the one hand, the gradualism of Darwinian evolution with the particular inheritance of uh, Mendel's ideas of uh, of genetics, uh, which led to this this, uh, this synthesis that evolution can be described as changes of uh, allele frequencies over time. Mm 
So the gene study takes this one step further and kind of combines the fact that you can describe evolution as a change in gene frequencies with a kind of uh, agential thinking that comes from the study of animal behavior that thinks of the best way to think about evolution then is to think if I was a gene, what would I do? And you kind of think of it, a, a genes as agents that struggle to, for uh, transmission to the next generation. You think of genes as having uh, goals and pursuing uh, strategies mm -hmm. um, and you kind of model evolution with that uh, in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and a consequence of this is that this idea that genes are what genes become the ultimate beneficiaries of, of evolution, that the new organisms are these kind of temporary occurrences that are here in one generation, gone in the next, whereas gene is what, what are passed on from parent to offspring and kind of forms the lineages as you go down evolutionary history. Um, so it uh, switches the, the kind of central notion of what the, the key agent of, of evolutionary explanation is. Yeah, do you think that's a, a product of just simply kind of uh, a kind of humble ignorance of sorts from Darwin? I mean, he didn't understand genes. We hadn't really got there yet. And so, you know, I don't know if the the you know, the whole theory that he laid out initially would have really changed that much. I mean, it certainly would have, you know, maybe contributed to some differences, but at the time he only had individuals, right? He only had individual organisms. He didn't have a concept of, of, uh, of genes or, or I don't want to say he didn't have a concept. He definitely has some kind of very, very, very rough outline of sort sketches of something there within our body. Um, but do, do you do you think that's typically why for a long time until we understood you know genes and getting to Mendel that's why the focus was on individual organisms as opposed to um, maybe you know massive groups or different types of organisms together because he just didn't have the understanding of of genes. I think that was part of it, as you say. Darwin had no function theory of uh, inheritance, some something that did cause him some. Uh, trouble, especially later in his uh, life, as he was wrestling with that, as yeah. it was pointed out by by critics that that was indeed a, a limitation of his uh, theory. Where, where would all of this variation uh, come from, and where is the the mechanism by which that is uh, transmitted uh, going to work? Now, um, you can understand a lot of evolution without any reference to the particular mechanism of inheritance. You, all you need is, is an understanding that there's a correlation between parents and offspring. Mm -hmm. So part of it, I think, is, is kind of that you can kind of have multiple ways of describing mm -hmm. evolution. Some that requires uh, references to genes, as we do in population genetics or in, in molecular uh, evolution genomics. But there's also a large part of evolutionary biology that uh, are quite comfortable a black boxing exactly how the, the mechanism of inheritance works, such in large studies of uh, animal uh, behavior that's relied on so called phenotypic gambit that mm -hmm. you assume that it is, 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 is heritable, but you don't go into the details of how that works. Mm -hmm. Quantitative genetics, both in evolutionary biology, but also in uh, applied fields like uh, plant and animal breeding, mm -hmm. um, don't necessarily go into the, to the details of genetics, but it's still uh, tremendously. Uh, successful in, in making predictions that, that can be uh, verified or rejected. Yeah, I, I, I haven't thought about it that way. That's interesting that, you know, evolution is one of the most powerful ideas and facts in the, in, you know, our, on our planet, in my opinion. And it's interesting to see that the power of evolution works despite knowing everything about it, right? So if you, if you don't use the genetic uh, framework to understand evolution. Of course, it's very helpful, um, and it's for many, many things. But you, it's not necessary for understanding the basic tenets. So basically, in my view, the the power of evolution is that it can work in different kinds of ways. It can have not only validity, but it can also have um, explanatory power of of how we understand the natural world, even if you don't understand all of the. The specific parts of it so there's like multiple uh modalities of of understanding the kind of the veracity of evolution even if not knowing all of the parts of it is that some ver version of what you're saying 
I, I think so. And, and I think it's, it's worth remembering that, yeah, as you say, the principles of evolution by natural selection are agnostic about the, the kind of the substrate mm -hmm. uh, to which they apply. Um, that is well demonstrated by the fact that uh, theoretical population genetics was developed uh, before what we knew what the material basis of inheritance actually was before we knew about double helices and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, knowing that has, me has meant that we have learned an enormous amount, much more about how uh, population genetics works, because now you can go out and test it. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I think for me, it comes back to the fact that uh, evolutionary biology is one of those fields that where you apply a wide variety of, of methods that are complementary to each other. Mm -hmm. And then while we can certainly apply a combination of methods in the sense that you can go out, people go out and do experiments where they quantify the strength of selection on, on phenotypes in the field, and then they can sequence those individuals and, and make inferences about the genetic architecture of the traits involved. They can get an understanding of the uh, what are the, the cellular traits that are involved in causing these phenotypes and so on. You can integrate across multiple levels. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of times they are kind of complementary to each other. You can get a good understanding without necessarily knowing the, uh, the molecular details of uh, the, what is being involved. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's, it's important to, especially at the beginning, right, to, to, to remember that because, you know, much of your book is, is interacting with the different types of arguments and theories of, of why we're looking at genes or why we should look at genes. But it's important to know that while it is very, very helpful to give a more robust and expansive picture of evolution, um, it's not necessarily to prove that evolution works or doesn't work in some ways. You state that the organisms are nothing but temporary occurrence present in one generation, gone in the next. So you, you alluded to this a few minutes ago. How are genes immortal? Uh, it's a kind of a... Uh, I don't know, a, a colorful way of saying that, I guess, but um, how, how genes are just moving from generation to generation to generation. And so in that way, you know, we, bodies are just the host, right? You know, <laughs> but how, how do you understand this idea that genes are immortal? The way that the, the genes I view defines the word gene has been the, uh, the source of some of the most contentious debates over the whole concept. Mm -hmm. The genes I view relies on, on a rather old fashioned definition of what a gene is, completely agnostic about any hard won details about the molecular structure of genes. Mm -hmm. So both in the selfish gene and also in adaptation and natural selection that was written by George Williams, mm -hmm. who came out a decade earlier, both of them define a genes as that part of a chromosome that is stably inherited, not broken up by, by recombination. Uh, and here, already here, you can see that this is going to lead to, you can get genes that vary in length. It can be a very short thing, or it can be a whole length of a, almost a whole length of, of a sex chromosome, for example, mm -hmm. or, or the whole mitochondrial uh, genome. So in this sense, what is passed on that, that is what is being passed on from parents to, to uh, offspring, that segment of, of a chromosome. Now, as a, as a tangent, and we may or may not return to this later on, both Williams and Dawkins had these ideas about what, what a gene is, isn't about anything material at all, but actually it's about the information mm -hmm. uh, there and, and what is being passed on. Mm -hmm. But here, in the, in the sense that a gene is considered immortal, is that you have something that is passed on intact from parent to offspring mm -hmm. in a way that an individual organism, the phenotypes that we observe, are kind of a unique combination of, of, of its gene and the, its environment in, in the interaction between the two. And that kind of unique combination of, of, of genes, environment, and, and, and G by E will never be recreated again. So it's kind of unique occurrence in evolutionary time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that and so the argument goes then, according to the genes I view, that can't be the central entity. You can't have evolutionary explanation in terms of organisms. You need to seek it at whatever is being transmitted from uh, one generation to the next. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you widen the lens here, it's, uh, it reminds me of kind of how people, many people still agree, I think, that from the Big Bang, the universe is still expanding. You know, it's, it's still expanding outward, and life is, is going. It's just going, right? And then I think if you get it all the way down to life on Earth, and then for us as humans, it's just moving. 
It's just going. Genes are trying their best to get to the next generation, whatever is going to be the most viable, the whatever is going to be the most, uh, I don't want to say attractive, but the one that's going to be most stable for them. And it's been that going that way on and on and on. But genes don't stay static or is it more of what's around them? So for example, if the genes from my parents, you know, passed down to me, it's not the same gene or maybe this kind of goes to the tangent of the information or, or is it the gene that's passed? Because there are things obviously that are uh, around uh, the, the genes um, within one's own body, within their, you know, their DNA makeup, and then also within the environment that are going to be different, right? We're not replicating, you know, clones of, you know, all these things. But so what is it that is uh, changing? What is it that is kind of uh, static as it moves through from generation to generation? So here, I think the, 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 the way information comes into to this debate is that it kind of the gene side view relies on a concept of the gene that uh, was developed before we knew anything about how the material basis of, of inheritance actually works. And it's kind of the, the gene of, in some ways of, of the record population genetics. And you just assume that you have something mm -hmm. that is being transmitted in, in a stable way and that we define as the as a gene, mm -hmm. and this way, it, it is almost kind of uh, goes back to Mendel's original definition of a gene as a stable, stably inherited difference maker, and mm -hmm. that is what what a, what a gene is. Mm -hmm. um, now, I've argue, I argue in the book that a central concept to to, to understand the the genes I view is this notion of the environment that is introduced by Ronald Fisher when he when he. Uh, defines the concept of, of variance. Mm -hmm. uh, and he notes that from the perspective of, of an allele, so it's one variant of a specific gene, the environment is not just anything that goes on outside of the, the organism. So the, you know, the temperature or the, the soil or the, the pH of the soil in which mm -hmm. this plant lives in, but it's also all the other genes inside of the same genome in which, which this allele finds itself but also all the other alleles that are segregating in the population that it finds itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's kind of, it's by, by understanding that that ought to count as the environment as well, that you can use the kind of the methods of, of, of Fisher to understand uh, kind of the average effect of, of one allele uh, over another. You, 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 in, in that regard, you talk about this, there's a struggle between different alleles and not necessarily different genes. And so, there's a an interesting, I guess you could say, paradox here, right? Of for, for many people get, I think, still to this day, get confused with Darwin's, or excuse me, uh, Dawkins, you know, selfish gene, which I think he's stated that that was probably not the best title. That there's a longer version of that, but that the gene is kind of what you're saying. If you kind of just you know, use a play on words of kind of an agent, it's trying to get to where it's most viable, you know, further down the line. Um, but isn't it also at the same time, kind of what you're saying, is it that genes are, I think this is what is, is somewhat complicated for people to understand. In one way, genes have to, or I don't want to say have to, but genes do work together in cooperation within an organism, right? There's a lot of cooperation that goes on within, we'll just take the human body just to make it easy, but you can branch this out to different organisms. But in the human body, we need all the genes to work together. Otherwise, we're just going to be we're not going to be viable to be a, an organism, you know, so they have to have cooperation. And yet there is this in the genes. eye, wanting to do one thing is to keep moving forward. So how do we kind of explain that kind of paradox uh, intrinsic or internal to uh, an, uh, a multicellular or even maybe single cellular organism? In many ways, the, the cell gene is, is an absolutely brilliant title for a book, right? It's, uh, is inviting and is exciting, and you kind of get curious about what, 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 what is going on mm -hmm. here. At the same time, both key words there, both selfish and gene, are used in somewhat an unusual way. Mm -hmm. One, of course, because a, a gene can't have any emotions at all. It's it's, it's just is. Right. Yes. So how, right. how can how can it be selfish or 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 or, or, or anything? Right. And and of course, you know, Dawkins was the first to, to acknowledge it. And then the point is that. The, the selfishness is, is a way of thinking that genes, uh, you can think of genes as if they are trying to promote their own uh, transmission. Mm 
And the point then is that often the best way to do that is to cooperate with other genes uh, in the genome. And this comes down to the idea that a lot of time, a better title would have been the, the, the cooperative gene mm -hmm. or, 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 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think I think the selfish gene summarizes the key point rather well. At the same time, you do invite some of these problems about what selfish is, selfishness uh, actually means. And, and if all genes are to be considered selfish, uh, you know, if it explains everything, does it explain anything? Mm -hmm. uh, and also you, you, you have ended up with the genes that are what we now refer to as selfish genetic elements, which historically have been called ultra selfish genes or, or mm -hmm. things like that, the genes that are, that are actually are selfish in a way that most genes are not, in the sense that they are promoting their own uh, transmission at the expense of the, the general fitness of, of the organism. Um, Daw Dawkins has famously n noted that perhaps the immortal gene would have been uh, mm -hmm. a better title. It would have conveyed mm -hmm. the central message because at the heart of it, um, of the concept of genes have you is the, is the idea that genes are special, mm -hmm. that they have this kind of unique property of what being what is transmitted and being transmitted in a uniquely stable uh, way. And therefore they deserve this unique place in our explanations. Uh, when I was writing the, the book, I was corresponding a little bit with Michael Rogers, who was the editor at OUP uh, who acquired the book. Uh, and, and, he, and he has, uh, you know, very uh, empathetically said that, that that would not, the immortal gene would not have been an equally good title. <laughs> and as a as an editor, he's probably very correct uh, yeah, about, yeah. Uh, about, yeah. about about that. Uh, so, the selfish gene does, even to this day, it grabs you. It definitely grabs you. Immortal, less so. It feels a little, I don't know, a, a little... Uh, I won't say spiritual, but it sounds a little odd. A selfish gene definitely grabs you, for sure. It, it really grabs you. And I think it, it, it also invites you to think a lot about the issues that are at stake, about the mm -hmm. way we use words and verbal models to describe uh, evolution and the kind of evolution often occupies this somewhat awkward state that it's you know, a traditional uh, scientific theory, but it's also because it's about the origins of the diversity of life and the origins of, of, of ourselves, it, it does touch us in, in a way that is um, different than, than other scientific uh, theories. And uh, the selfish gene invites you to, 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 to think about all of those issues. Uh, as you say, that perhaps the immortal gene, though being more accurate, perhaps, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and getting to the core of the concept in a better way, uh, does not. Yeah, there, there's a, I've talked about it a little bit on the podcast and uh, it's, it's one of the better books I read this year, which was uh, The Social Instinct by Nicola Rehani. And she talks about in the first section about how genes within a body, the human body, are cooperative. And her, the whole book's about, you know, uh, cooperation, the, the, the finer sides and the darker sides of cooperation. But uh, and that's her research and stuff. And so, you know, she talks about, you know, how, yes, the selfish gene is, is, a, is you know, is obviously a reality, but uh, genes in an organism do cooperate together. That's how we are. So cooperation is all the way down at the cellular and, and genetic level, and then it branches all the way out until, um, you know, different humans and how we interact with other people. So um, in terms of uh, adaptation, so let's just talk about adaptation because this is a key piece and this is something that is, um, well, well, we'll get to some of the debates people have, I guess, about this, but what it, you, you state that it, adaptation is the appearance of design in the living world, right? And so this is something that gets people, um, again, kind of uh, up in arms, especially when we start talking about folks that are uh, prominent holders of um, intelligent designer and, and things like that, or some creationists. But before we get there, this appearance of design in the living world, so an appearance, not actual design. Um, how do you explain that definition or that meaning of adaptation? And why is adaptation so essential to how we understand evolution? Uh, design, as you say, is one of those words that the, uh, we as evolutionary biologists have a rather awkward relationship yeah, yeah. with. Uh, on the one hand, you, you may say that the, the, the appearance of design or, the, or adaptation that organisms look so perfectly suited many times to the environment in which uh, 
they live in and they do so in rather spectacular uh, ways is mm -hmm. one of the most striking features of, of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the fact that they, they, they do that, that they have this kind of striking appearance has been part then of what is known as the, the argument uh, from design or argument to design uh, that has been a central part of certain branches of, of natural theology. Uh, the, the idea that you can make inferences about the, the divine world from studying the, the natural world. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a tradition that has been strong in, in, in many in many uh, faith traditions. Yeah. Uh, it has been very strong in the, the Anglican uh, tradition of, of Protestant Christianity, mm -hmm. um, and perhaps best illustrated by uh, by William Paley. He was a incredibly popular writer who wrote a book called uh, Natural Theology, which is a, it's a incredible book in many ways. It's, it's a lovely study of um, adaptations in, in mm -hmm. numerous organisms. Mm -hmm. And it's well worth reading today too, for, for, for that reason. But he uses that then to build his argument that this, you can, from this, you can infer the, uh, the existence of a god. Mm -hmm. Now, why, why kind of adaptations or the, then the appearance of design becomes important for evolutionary biology is that there is a, uh, school sorted in evolution biology that takes them that this is what we need to explain that in, in, in evolution by natural selection, you get an alternative explanation for Paley's, uh, Paley's facts. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a long tradition, you know, Charles Darwin was very taken by, uh, by Paley's uh, writings. He, he read him when he uh, was an undergraduate, undergraduate uh, at Cambridge. Uh, and, and also later generations of, of, of evolutionary biologists have also mentioned that it is the, these sets of facts is what a theory of evolution must explain. And I would say that if both uh, George Williams uh, and perhaps especially Richard Dawkins are very much of that tradition, that they take adaptation to be kind of the central problem that a theory of evolution must be able to, to explain. Mm -hmm. So I think you can view the genius I view as part of an attempt to explain that they take adaptations to be the central problem. Uh, and that's why they, they put so much emphasis on that. When we uh, explain adaptation, we must answer the question, what is the, what is the kind of the ultimate beneficiary of this uh, adaptation? And according to the genes I viewed, only the gene, uh, because the gene is again, is the immortal thing that's being passed on from one generation to the next, only the gene can satisfy that role of being the ultimate beneficiary of uh, of natural uh, selection. Mm -hmm. Now, it should be emphasized, I think, that there, there are many good rivals to, to, to adaptation. Uh, you know, I think a lot of my colleagues would say that kind of explaining the diversity of, of life is kind of, a, kind of a problem of kind of equal uh, or bigger uh, importance than, than expanding, explaining uh, adaptations. And I think there is a, there is certainly variation within the field of what you consider to be the important, the most important question and, and how, mm -hmm. How much emphasis we should lay on on, on adaptations as being the, the, the central thing to explain. Mm. I, so I have uh, one question about that, but before I get there, so so just to kind of uh, nail it down here, uh, people can be, I think, sometimes very confused about well, if there are so take the natural uh, theology kind of piece of it, you know, well, it, there's all this diversity of life, and there's all these ways in which certain animals or organisms or whatever adapt to their corresponding environments. See, there has to be a mover behind that, right? That's authoring all of this, and you know, I'm giving the very cartoon version mm -hmm. of that argument, but you know, that's a rough outline of it, and. You know what? What Darwin and, and everyone after him on that side of things would say is, is that uh, no, you you don't need an intelligent designer behind it shaping and molding this. There is adaptation, and it's adapting to the environment because there's a, a certain willing that's happening within what natural selection that it needs to move forward. How how do we? I guess in the in the best way of doing that, say why with adaptations, any type of you know first cause or first mover or whatever intelligent designer is not required or necessary. How can we understand as best we can that answer from within nature itself? Yeah, so I guess one way of, of thinking about it is, is that I think with Darwin, you got an alternative explanation to design, if you will. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, by all this differ, whether you should embrace the word design or you should, whether you should always mm -hmm. try to, 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 to avoid it. Mm -hmm. um, 
and we, the importance that we got a alternative explanation is that the weakness of the so-called design argument was pointed out already by by Hume, who had shown that that's, that argument does not necessarily work, that you can infer the existence of a designer from the properties of, of the natural world. The problem for Hume, of course, was that he didn't know, he couldn't provide a, uh, a satisfactory explanation for what had caused the, um, the striking features of, of, of the living world. Now, that, so what, what, what we offer instead is, is the theory of evolution by natural selection. And it's not necessarily that it, that it needs to do anything, but natural selection is the, the, the mechanism or the main mechanism at least that we know that, that can cause uh, uh, adaptations. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that, all, 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 of course, not all phenotypes or evolution is about, is caused by natural selection. We know that a lot of it is due to, to chance or genetic drift or, or a combination of, 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 of the two. Um, but the, the, I think the centrality of, of adaptation is that Adaptations have often been used to argue for, has this long kind of tradition of being argued for in, in, in kind of in, in theological uh, debates as well. And that's why I think it, it continues to, to occupy uh, a, a special uh, position uh, within our explanations. So in, in terms of that, how, yeah, because there, there's many things. So it's so there are some folks in, in within uh, various types of uh, biology or, or ecological uh, behavior behaviorists that, that will look at, well, it's not just about adaptation, right? What about, you know, the contributions of sexual selection? What about the contributions of aesthetics and certain types of beauty and things like that? You know, is there a way in which it's not just adaptation all the way down, right? Is there other aspects? So you kind of mentioned some of the genetic drift. Uh, I think I usually think of you know, noise or certain types of payoff. Or there, there's just different things that it's not all adaptation. So how do we how do we find where we start to see all this kind of uh, things pulling together or pulling apart of how do we I mean, we're not going to ever know a kind of, you know, causal one to one kind of thing. But how do we kind of have these ideas of. Well, if it's not all adaptation, well, what are the other things removed from that still works within a natural world that's not part of intelligent designer, et cetera, things like that? Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess, I guess a couple of things to, 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 to tease apart here that hmm. there, are, there are many things that, that can, can result in, in adaptation. And, and uh, uh, you, you know, sexual selection is, is one mechanism that, that can lead to, to, to adaptation and it often led to some of the most uh, extraordinary forms of adaptation that are involved in, um, uh, in kind of the attraction of, of mates or in the uh, competition for access to to mates. Um, I think, and I think it's also worth separating that you can think that uh, adaptation is the, the central thing that needs to be explained. But uh, one thing that that um, George Williams was very uh, serious about is that adaptation is what he's called as an onerous concept that should only be invoked when you have the sufficient evidence uh, for it. Uh, the, um, the, the subtitle of Adaptation and Natural Selection, George Williams' book from 1966, was a critique of some current evolutionary thought. Mm. And the kind of the current evolutionary thought that he was particularly critical of was what he viewed as the uncritical or unnecessary invocation of, of group selection arguments. It's kind mm -hmm. of for the good mm -hmm. of the species, for the good of the group mm -hmm. arguments when there was no kind of proper evidence for it. Uh, and he, he kind of a while I think you can read the adaptation selection as very much kind of the first clear articulation of the GSI view is also one of the the, uh, the clearest articulation of that we need to take the study of adaptation uh, seriously. Mm. Uh, the the paper that we often cite to make this point is the Spandrels so-called Spandrels paper by Lewinton and, and, and Gold that will be published a couple of years uh, later. Uh, but I mean, Williams made many of the same point that adaptation is a special thing, but you need to be very careful how you explain it. And there are many, many ways in which natural selection may not be uh, particularly effective, depending on uh, everything from um, population size or population structure, which means that tech is not very effective to uh, developmental constraints or uh, correlations between traits that mean that selection can't act uh, particularly 
effectively. So kind of it's very different from recognizing that adaptations are special from, from the idea that all traits are necessarily adaptations, which we are, we know that they are, they are not, right. or that all traits are the product of, of natural selection. Again, which you, mm-hmm. we know they, they are not. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's often very easy to come up with a, a scenario where that is consistent with uh, an adaptive scenario, but the, the kind of the challenge of the whole enterprise lies in uh, setting up a, a proper test uh, on that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's a, sometimes a, 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 a danger in trying to uh, kind of give a just so story, right? Because this happened, so it must be this and it's just because of this. And, and, um, and, and I think that that's, there can be a danger of that because we understand, like I said, you know, there's byproducts, there's noise, there's many things that are contributors within the world and not everything is explainable or you can be explained away. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that's important to, to recognize, but people will give criticisms of, well, it's just all adaptation all the way down. It's like, well, you know, I mean, there, yes, I mean, there's lots of adaptations in the natural world, but that's not everything. That's not the whole story. There are many other things that aren't part of that. And so, Oh, absolutely. And, and I think you, you, you can be an, ad, an adaptationist in, in, in the sense that you think that adaptation is the most exciting part, but mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. recognizing that, that that may well be is a tiny part of all evolutionary mm-hmm. history that, that, that leads to that, that most of the time things are evolving uh, neutrally and so on. I mean, I received my, my training in uh, kind of population comparative uh, genomics for, for my PhD. And, and there, you know, it's, it's a very strong emphasis on, you know, the ideas of neutral evolution, the ideas of uh, mm-hmm. Moto Kimura and, and, and his uh, success, uh, successors, um, there you, you always test the kind of a novel model of, of, of neutral evolution. And uh, you may be interested in kind of in general how, how, how genomes evolve, and then you can ask questions about how much of that is under positive selection or, or negative selection, how much is evolving neutrally. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, but you, you may also be studying population uh, genomics, and you're only really interested in those few sites that are evolving under strong positive selection. And then you, 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 may not, you may not be particularly interested in if that's very common or very rare, but you want to know what is that and what, what, what is driving that. And I think that's the same can be true about, uh, about phenotypes that you, you may recognize that it's only rarely, that this is a separate question of how often does evolution lead to these extraordinary adaptations. It may be rare, it may be common, but what I, I want to study those instances when it mm-hmm. does lead to, to that. Right. And right. I think that you, you can kind of separate the, separate the two. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Uh, you, you mentioned it, so I just wanted to, to just ask, you know, how do you typically define population genetics and why is it important to, to study in terms of many of the things that you're talking about in terms of genes, IV, and things like that? You know, you're talking about, most of the time they're talking about um, genetic shift, if I remember correctly, is what they look at for groups over populations. They're, they're mostly uh, interested in that, in that, yes, whereas genetic variants are usually for individuals so is typically kind of the, the way, the polarity of it, but not, not entirely. But so how do you just see the role of population genetics um, in terms of understanding genes for individuals and then genes for various organisms, including humans? So I think yeah, population genetics is the, is the branch of genetics or branch of evolutionary biology that uses uh, mathematical models to describe the, uh, the changes in allele frequencies uh, over time. And often when we construct these models, we are interested in, in making inferences about the, uh, kind of the relationship between selection, uh, mutation, uh, migration, and, and drift, and kind of asking questions about if you have uh, mutations with these properties that arise under these circumstances, what will happen to, to, to this kind of mutations? And in many ways, th- this has and continue to provide the, the, the uh, theoretical backbone of, mm. of evolutionary biology. Kind of classic definition of evolution in many introductory textbooks is simply that evolution is a change in uh, allele uh, frequencies. And you, know, you can have a debate whether that is, is, is a sensible definition at the end of the day, but uh, the fact is that uh, population genetics brings a kind of formality and a rigor to, to, to evolution. Uh, that, it, that is tremendously uh, helpful uh, in, 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 in the study of, of, of evolution. Yeah, no, that's that's my reading of it too. And, and some of the people that I know that do population genetics, they're they're, they're it, <laughs> they do give the kind of nice backbone of things, but their 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 hands are in many different buckets. They're they're looking at 
history, they're looking at anthropology, they're looking at biology, they're looking at so many things because of, it's an interesting subset or a field because it has a lot of um, convergence in many, uh, many fields of studies. It really does feel kind of like a kind of interdisciplinary kind of uh, subset of, of uh, genetic studies. I mean, the evolution by, by evolution biology by its very nature is a historical science. We, mm -hmm. we, we are trying to make inferences about things that happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think things for those uh, who study uh, population genetics in, in humans uh, specifically, uh, that, that is somewhat different than um, if you do it in, say, in, in fruit flies or, 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 or in plants. Because in humans, you, you inevitably end up then interacting with uh, several other fields that are, that are studying the same thing, whether that, that be uh, anthropology or mm -hmm. other other branches of, uh, of, of of biology, and you um, you're, 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 yeah, you run into some unique uh, challenges there that you don't do when when you study that in in Drosophila, for, for example. Yeah, I, I just uh, finished the the book by um, Kyle Harper on uh, called Plagues Upon the Earth. And it's, it's basically a, a history of uh, on, on the planet <laughs> of plague and disease. Um, and he, he mentions in various points in the book about how population genetic studies are really important to understand our past history of uh, disease. And so there, there's just so many utilities. Um, I think people sometimes, I mean, I definitely don't, don't realize that how population genetics can be. Uh, super important for understanding more of our our history and for humans and and, and many other uh, organisms. Uh, you mentioned uh, Paley's uh, concept of design and 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 you know why his kind of natural uh, theology was important. So maybe just kind of give us briefly the you know why that was important for the history of evolution in, in terms of where it pushed other people to kind of give a response to that. So it, it kind of was saying. Well, here's some of my ideas about it and, and sort of trying to point back to, you know, a creator or whatever. And then that kind of spurred on other people to say, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe that's not quite where it is. Kind of his significance in the kind of, you know, I guess the, the overall, you know, corpus of some of this literature. William Paley was an, uh, an English uh, clergyman who was active just as the, the 18th turned into to the 19th uh, century. Uh, he wrote on, on uh, numerous uh, topics. So, some of his most influential writings of, of, of the day was on, on moral and political uh, philosophy, uh, writings that were also widely read uh, both at universities and among uh, politicians uh, of the day, both in his native England, but also in the, the young republic of, of the United States. Uh, why we kind of tend to come across him in uh, the history of evolutionary biology was that he was also very interested in uh, in study in, in the study of, of life and kind of cataloging instances of uh, what we now would describe as um, adaptations. He is uh, famous perhaps for having popularized the idea of the, the watchmaker uh, analogy, which is he is how he opens the, uh, the his book. Uh, natural theology published in 1802 where it describes that you walk you're walking across a heath and you come across a uh, pocket watch and you, when you find it you can kind of see that this watch is clearly different from any uh, rocks that you also find in, in the field that this is as opposed to the rock this has clearly been the uh the, it's a product of of a designer and he argues that uh, a living organism is infinitely more complicated complex than than a watch so if he can infer that a watch as a designer, so must uh, an organism. And that is kind of the, the premise of his uh, work uh, there. And this was kind of part of a tradition to uh, build a case for the existence of a creator from the study of the, the natural world. Uh, now, he is famous for having popularized it. There, there's some good reasons to believe that he more or less plagiarized it from a, a Dutch uh, a theologian who, who constructed the arguments uh, uh, previously, uh, but as I said, th this had a huge influence, and he was widely read. So Darwin read um, uh, several books by Paley, uh, uh, including uh, natural uh, theology, uh, and uh, he describes in, in, in his notes and, and letters to friends just how taken he was uh, by it, and kind of early on in his life convinced by that uh, 
uh, argument. Um, and it's kind of in that context then that you can uh, think of uh, or evolution as being partly a, a response to that as an exp alternative explanation uh, for the, the appearance of the sign. Why, why it becomes particularly relevant here is again that I think both George Williams and Richard Dawkins were kind of taken by that way of viewing the history of evolution, mm -hmm. that evolution and by natural, and natural selection as, as an answer due to Paley's as uh, a problem posed by, by Paley. Uh, Richard Dawkins you know, has a, a, a later on published a book called The Blind Watchmaker that mm -hmm. uses uh, Paley's uh, watchmaker analogy as kind of the whole setup for the book to, to uh, lay out the, the power of natural selection. Uh, George Williams, in, in one of his very last books published in 1992, not long before he, 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 uh, he passed away, uh, um, a book called Natural Selection, which is kind of a reflection on his views on these ideas of evolution and natural selection from his career, uh, includes an, uh, as an appendix uh, excerpts from uh, Paley's uh, natural theology is, is to kind of uh, illustrate the, uh, the, the power of the argument and the, the beauty of, of, of his writing. I mean, Paley may be accused for not being the most original thinker, uh, but he, he, that he is a tremendously skilled uh, writer, I think is, is, is indisputable. You, you mentioned, um, you know, that that was the central problem they had to address, right? Which was how do we view adaptive complexity and apparent design in the world? That was the problem. That's what they were trying to answer and talk about. And so I guess fast forwarding to, you know, obviously work that, you know, Williams and Darwin and Dawkins and um, have done, you know, they've answered some of that. And yet, and yet uh, that's line or, 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 or tradition of thought from Paley that lives on in uh, folks such as Alistair McGrath, who, who I, I, I greatly respect, actually. I think he's a very sharp mind. Um, and then you have some other uh, creationists, such as uh, Behe and Dembski and, and folks like that, that have written still on this kind of intelligent design uh, uh, um, tradition. How do we... <laughs> Why does this still persist, right? If, if is is it that Dawkins and Williams and and you know their arguments weren't convincing enough? They didn't answer Paley's question, and so you got a whole cast of you know more modern new crew that say, well, what about this and what about this, you know? Or why does this idea of intelligent design, I guess, still exist, barring any? Um, I know this is kind of hard to tease out, but any theological or uh, a religious dogma kind of influence into it, if you're just taking the arguments on itself. Why do you think that still kind of hangs around a little bit? I think this comes back to the fact that even the theory of evolution can never be just like any other scientific theory. Because mm -hmm. on some level, the theory of evolution is just a theory by different rates of sex and death leads to different configurations of, of carbon molecules, right? That's all there is to it on, 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 on some level. At the same time, it, it, it is kind of our story of creation uh, in, in the world that we, that we live in. So I think there's a reason why you have uh, all these bust ups at school board meetings in the United States over the theory of evolution and not over the over other scientific theories. Because I think for good and for worse, evolution probably deals, strikes us in, in, in a different uh, way. And I think you can handle it in different ways. I mean, kind of modern intelligent design proponents, I think, um, are often driven by le less by the scientific data, but more about a dealing with it, coming to terms with the philosophical implications of a theory like that. Um, I think someone like Alison McGrath stands out there as someone who is, is a theologian, but also, of course, a trained scientist and who, who can write insightfully and interestingly about how if you come from that kind of background of faith, how should you wrestle with the facts of uh, yeah. evolution? And, yeah. and uh, uh, that, that, that is an enterprise that I think can be quite uh, rewarding, even if you don't share mm -hmm. his particular belief on, on, on the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there's just sometimes, again, I, that's why I, I said initially, I have a lot of respect for McGrath because he, he seems to really try to, to take the, the arguments on face value and, and, and less of some of the religious doctrine in, imposed in the kind of arguments of things and whereas others uh, less so. 
Um, I, there's two two final questions here uh, before we, we move into a little bit on selfish genes because you spend I think the bulk or middle part of your book about selfish genes, which will you know break down a little bit further. But um, you, you talk about um, you know so Fisher, you mentioned him, but that uh, the environment was important for the genes I view, right? And the genetic variation is key for fitness, and so. Could you explain, I guess, the, the additive uh, genetic variants and how that one allele will change, how one allele changing, excuse me, can, you know, actually change and impact the environment? Just talk about his kind of contribution and the idea of uh, the, that environment has on, on the uh, alleles and genes. So Fisher was, of course, the, uh, the person who introduced the very term variants, and he did so in, in a published a paper published in uh, 19... Uh, 18 and the problem that he was interested in uh, one problem that he was interested in is if you can kind of calculate the the average effect that happens when you replace one allele uh, with another how that is going to affect the, uh, the phenotype of the uh, of the organism um, and in order to make that calculation to what kind of happens when you replace one allele uh, with another at a particular site in the genome the way that you often get that calculations to work is that is that you hold the rest of the, the, the whole environment constant because only that and only that way you can kind of do a fair comparison of what happens when you have say two copies of the same allele versus only having uh, one copy of that particular allele and in to do that that's when he introduced this kind of what i described you can describe as this kind of expanded version of the expanded notion of the environment that includes not just the the abiotic the environment surrounding the organism, but also from an allele's point of view, all the other uh, genes uh, in the genome, the allele that is located at the same homologous sites, mm -hmm. as well as all the other uh, alleles segregating uh, in the in the population. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of by holding all of those aspects constant as well, you can kind of see what happens if I replace this allele mm -hmm. with another allele, and you can kind of calculate uh, the effect of that. And both Williams and Dawkins you in their various ways describe a scenario where you know you shuffle all possible alleles around in, in a sexually reproducing population and you can kind of the idea that you can kind of calculate the average effects of having and um, the presence or absence of, of an allele these are these are ideas that can very much be traced back to, to, to fisher's way of conceptualizing uh, evolution now there is this there's a big debate between fisher and, and, and in his time uh, with uh, the american civil rights or the, whether this kind of averaging strategy can work and when it when it breaks down. Um, part of it is kind of the idea of what you can do, the idea of additive genetic variance, which is simply the idea that the sum of, you can kind of think of an allele has a certain effect and, and another allele has another there has another effect. And is the, the sum of those effects simply additive or are they, do they interact in a kind of a non-additive way? So is it not just the sum of, of the, their independent effects or is it, more greater or, or smaller than that. Uh, and this kind of, in general, this kind of averaging effect, um, whether it works or not, is, is kind of at the heart of many of these kind of technical disagreements of, uh, that goes back to, to, to Wright and, and, and Fisher, and it has in many ways continued uh, to, uh, to, to, to this day. Uh, I think what you can say about the, the genes I view, it works best when the effects of genes are, it's, I think, it, you know, it's, it's a, work best when we can think of genes as being somewhat uh, independent of each other in, 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 the, in their effects um, and, and ignoring some of these kind of other uh, epistatic uh, interactions. Yeah, I think that's interesting to that contribution of when you're looking at variants and then you're trying to see how can we, you know, the environment's never static, but how can we understand some components where we kind of can understand all the different things that are changing and, and evolving. Uh, the, in his contribution with understanding uh, the the changes that alleles will have within an environment, I think, are you know super important. Obviously, you know Fisher was you know uh, I believe a eugenicist, and as uh, many people were in his day, uh, but he also had a big contribution to many of the statistical methods we use uh, today as well. Um, so his, his contributions uh, great, uh, barring his maybe application of how he wanted to use it, which was maybe not so good. Um, last thing here is is uh, on group selection. So I know this is a, 
contentious debates. So I'm not going to try and get you to fall on one side or another. I don't want you, I don't want you to piss off somebody. So, um, <laughs> but maybe just, just briefly just say what group selection is and then why it's controversial, I guess. And so, uh, and then would we need group selection if we understand reciprocity, interdependence, cooperation at large, et cetera, with individual organisms? You know, do we need group selection at a mass or last, excuse me, mass level to, to understand that. So maybe just tell us what it is and kind of why people fight about it and, and if it would be really needed. In, in, a, in a way, the, the, the summarize is part of the book rather well. So in, in this kind of first uh, part of the book, uh, I make the argument that the genes that we very much rest on three, uh, stands on three legs, so it's intellectual core, it's made up of three parts. The first is this kind of commitment to uh, adaptation as the a uh, central problem that a theory of evolution must be able to explain. I think it's a tendency that you can trace back to, to Paley. Um, the second is, is an approach to population genetics, first laid out by, uh, by Fisher, and in particular kind of here is the importance of his expanded notion of the, the environment. Uh, and the third leg then is, a, um, uh, is related to the broader uh, levels of selection debate, and particularly kind of a rejection of uh, group selection uh, explanations. Um, starting with uh, George uh, Williams, he, um, uh, as I mentioned, he, he, he used the subtitle of the book, a critique of some current evolutionary thought. And the current uh, thought that he was frustrated with was the, uh, the application of, of group selection uh, arguments. And he, in the, the 30th anniversary edition of the book, he, 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 retell, he tells the story of how he, when he, uh, he was working at the University of Chicago. He was uh, attending a, uh, a talk by a particularly prominent group selection proponent of, of, of his day. And, and kind of walking back from that, he was thinking to himself, or I think he might even told his, uh, his wife, that Doris uh, Williams, another prominent evolutionary biologist, that if this is what counts as evolutionary biology, you know, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it. Um, similarly, uh, Dawkins was, was motivated by, by many of the same kind of concerns, the kind of popularity of the invocation of group selection arguments, both in um, popular science books and, and uh, uh, BBC documentaries about animal uh, behaviors. And what they were critical of was an old form of, of group selection uh, arguments that even I think group selection proponents today would describe as um, naive, where you describe things that orgasm would just um, uh, would sacrifice themselves for, for the good of the group to kind of avoid overpopulation and so on. And this is kind of the the, the boogeyman for these kind of uh, arguments are are uh, the uh, the Bridget Win Edwards who, who kind of advocated this form of, of, of group selection, and that is a form of group selection that's kind of uh, has very few uh, advocates uh, today. Uh, this situation today is really quite different, uh, though there are kind of uh, skirmishes um, somewhat regularly about the, the value of group selection or not. I think th there has been many advances in the sense that you can, you can recognize that group selection and alternative frameworks such as uh, pretty kind of inclusive fitness uh, models often can, can generate uh, the same uh, predictions of the, the direction of, of, of evolutionary change. And it becomes a both, uh, either kind of a, a question of uh, your personal preference in how you, how you uh, prefer to, to, to model the, the, the scenario. And I think uh, the, the, yeah, the, the kinds of group selection models that people develop today are very different from the, what they were in the 1960s. Uh, and, and so, the situation that we have today, you know, if you, if you want to construct group section of models, I think they can be uh, can be sound and mathematical, uh, mathematically proper. Uh, and if that's how you, how you prefer to conceptualize it, I think few would have an issue with uh, with that. What what is the I guess the biggest difference between today as opposed to earlier on with group selection? So how do people mostly figure about or talk about it today? with various mathematic model, mathematical models that is opposed to how it kind of was, you know, initially it was, you know, someone, you know, falls on the sword for the better of the group, see, they're all trying to get the group to survive or, to, you know, whatever. As today, it's different. You know, I guess what are the major differences between how it was and how it is now? Because I do think it still has much allure 
a lot, a lot of appeal to people, uh, group selection today. So how do you kind of see it in today's version? Yeah, I think here is also kind of the difference where you encounter the arguments over uh, group selection. My impression mm -hmm. is that evolution Bali has paid host to some of the most intense dust-ups Yes. Or, 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 or or the concept of group selection. Mm -hmm. But now I think you can recognize that the way people construct these forms of models today can be uh, are, 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 are sound. And kind of a, a key point of contention early on was whether how do you measure group fitness? Do you measure it in terms of the number of groups that a, a group produce or in terms of the number of individuals that the survivor reproduce within a given group? Mm -hmm. uh, and today, you know, you can construct an, a, a group selection model so that's where you measure that it's kind of fitness is measured in terms of individuals, mm -hmm. individual fitness. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that, you know, Maynard Smith was very critical of, that we, sh we shouldn't call that group selection, but now we do. And while I can be sympathetic to, to Maynard Smith's argument, I think that argument was lost. And now uh, that is what we call group, group selection. It, I think it turns out that often to get those models to work, you end up identifying the same kind of parameters that are important in the inclusive fitness and kin selection models that need mm -hmm. to have high relatedness or codependence between mm -hmm. the individuals that are interacting cooperatively with each other and that kind of need that whether it's relatedness or some other mechanism of mm -hmm. that cooperators come together must be higher within the groups and between groups and that is at the heart of why you can kind of conceptualize that either as a, a kin selection or inclusive fitness model on the one hand or as a group selection model uh, on the other hand, so I think the kind of the, the mathematical sophistication is kind of a crucial part why um, uh, why group selection has a higher commands bigger respect now than what it did at a time where quite simple models could show that the verbal arguments of Win Edwards um, simply wouldn't work that that that, that would never be uh, as a, a, a pow as powerful of an evolutionary force as he imagined it to be. Um, but but isn't those those pieces though of kin selection, reciprocity, interdependence, cooperation that they don't have to be a part of group selection? It could be a more of a dyad between you know one or two people, or, or sure it could be in a very general sense of the word for the group, if you will. But that doesn't mean that it's necessarily for that. You have individuals working um in tandem with other individuals but it, it doesn't necessarily mean in the in the kind of a traditional sense for the group or for group selection it, it's more of a individual basis of, of sorts um i just don't understand how if you have so cooperation is not equivalent to me or interdependence is not equivalent to group selection both internally for the for human body or for an organism and then you know with certain uh, other other people involved so i mean are people just kind of, is this becoming a semantical argument that people are starting to see all the mathematical ways or ways of models we can construct of understanding cooperation or reciprocity or, or, or things like that and just calling that now group selection or do we see those things as distinctly different? I, 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 I do think that this is partly a, uh, a semantic debate, mm -hmm. but, but, but I want to add that just because something is semantic does not mean that it's uninteresting or unimportant. I mean, semantics ultimately is about what we mean by, by different mm -hmm. terms. Mm -hmm. And here's kind of like, I think that it was, it was a major um, breakthrough when you can recognize that the models that are kind of con constructed using in kind of inclusive or kin selection language mm -hmm. can lead to the same predictions as models constructed in kind of group selection language that really, I think, put a lot of it, took, took out a lot of the hot air from, from this debate. Uh, it does raise the question of the, like, they are not necessarily then kind of causally the same, just because mm -hmm. something is mathematically the same mm -hmm. does not necessarily mean it's causally the same. And that I think is, is, a, is a very interesting question. It, sometimes it's a question that perhaps uh, doesn't get the, the attention that it uh, deserves. So, and I, I'm kind of with two minds on this. Uh, on the one hand, I'm quite relaxed about the fact that in biology, in general, in evolutionary biology in particular, we can have multiple ways of explaining the same Thing, that we're never going to have this, you know, universal mathematical model that can explain everything. You know, biology will never have that in the way that you can at least aspire mm -hmm. to in, in, in fundamental uh, physics. That being said, um, I think we should at least part of the time worry about if our models, uh, our, our multiple models are making incompatible 
uh, assumptions mm -hmm. about how the world work. And there, I think, I think perhaps, I, I think th that is an interesting issue that is lingering in, in kind of the, the, the group of individual levels of selection uh, debates that it's one thing to show that they can often lead to the same prediction. That doesn't mean that the models are uh, the same or causally the same. Uh, and that I think uh, is an issue. I'd like to see more uh, attention uh, given to. Yeah, no, I, I, I fully agree with, with, uh, with everything you said there. So one of the major uh, sections in your book, or for much of the, the middle of the book, is you talk about the selfish gene or selfish genes. Um, and so obviously this comes from uh, Richard Dawkins, selfish gene, came out in 1976, I think that's right. 76, yeah. And so um, maybe let's just, we've been talking about genes a little bit, so we can just kind of give a small overview of how, could you talk about it this part in the book uh, of um, what is a gene? Uh, why do people have so many different uh, definitions of it? And how do you usually explain the process or difference between gene, chromosome, DNA, and protein? Because proteins are a super important aspect. Um, maybe just kind of give us that kind of, you know, brief snapshot of that. Yeah, so we touched upon this uh, a little bit, that uh, yeah. gene is one of those terms that, uh, that biologists use in, in a rather different ways, depending on what corner of the field that they were brought up in. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the gene of the, uh, the, uh, the gene survey, which is sometimes also called the, the, uh, the evolutionary gene, uh, is defined simply as whatever is uh, stably uh, inherited. So a kind of a part of chromosome that is, um, and this, this kind of fussiness around the, the boundaries of it has been a source of contentions. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. you have a uh, partial molecular genetics where I spent uh, a lot of time and effort to, to figure out the, kind of the, the exact, exact uh, boundaries of it. Um, and also kind of thinking carefully about what kind of the, the minimal properties of it uh, should be in terms of kind of uh, the material, material uh, properties of, of, a, of a chromosome. And the gene side view is, is completely agnostic uh, mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. And this is also related to that, especially Dawkins and, and, and others have, have preferred to talk about replicators rather than mm -hmm. genes, mm -hmm. in particular to kind of further divorce it from uh, uh, these kind of material proper properties. Mm. Um, so chromosomes uh, you know, are the, the um, uh, the blocks of uh, DNA uh, in which uh, gen the genetic uh, material is uh, organized in, uh, in many uh, organisms. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is kind of why you can talk about uh, species different in number of uh, chromosomes that they, they carry. Uh, this is something that uh, biologists have been able to study for a, a long time because you can, you can stain them and you can view them under a uh, microscope. So a cytologist and such geneticists had a very good understanding of this uh, long before we knew about uh, genes themselves or knew about uh, what they were actually made of these chromosomes. Uh, and a kind of function of, of, of proteins or the, kind of the, the building blocks uh, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the body uh, uh, are then kind of the product of, of, of certain genes, of protein coding genes, which are often only a small proportion of, of most genomes, though this varies dramatically between uh, organisms in, in humans is a rather small portion of the genome that, that uh, where the DNA makes actual uh, proteins. And but then you have much larger parts of the genomes that are, are involved in, in regulating how and when proteins are, are, are made. And then these then becomes the, the building box of actually making and, and making any sort of function in, in, uh, in a uh, body. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very nice way of how, how you explained it. What, what is the, the, um, you, I think you talk about it somewhere in there in the book about why the length of the gene is important. And so I, I would imagine there's something to do with some types of variants or again, we're trying to talk about which information is getting passed down. And so just, just tell us why the length of the gene for you is, 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 is important. Yeah. So, the, so this they come back to them that both Dawkins and Williams define a gene as what is being passed on and not being broken up by, by recombination, which otherwise may, mm -hmm. Uh, break up genetic material. Uh, so you kind of, this, because it's defined in this way, it invites the, the criticism that either this may become a, a really long thing and you really want to bite the bullet that the, the majority of the, the, the Y chromosome or, or, or sex chromosomes that doesn't recombine with the, 
uh, the, the other six chromosome that that ought to count as one gene mm -hmm. and you know the genes have you tells you to, to just accept that uh, similarly you can say that recombination is so pervasive that you can't really talk about any segment of length and it's absurd to talk about one or a couple of base pairs as being a gene um, and I think here you really this kind of debate about how the genes have used notion of a gene interacts with uh, what we know about um, nucleic acid or what we know about how, how DNA and chromosome actually works. Okay. It strikes in a way, I think, to, to, the, to the heart of uh, the, the concept that the genes I view really is mostly interested in understanding the logic of natural selection. So it kind of is quite comfortable about being fuzzy or agnostic about some of these kind of details, because often the question that they are interested in is how can a trait like this ever evolve? Yeah. How can a, a kind of gene that, how can, if you think of a, a gene that causes, if you allow us to kind of shortcuts to talk about that is a gene because this kind of a trait, how can that ever uh, evolve? And that's why I think these kind of debates about group selection were particularly uh, important because they were interested in issues that uh, explaining things like uh, altruism in, in new social insects, where you had traits that are costly to the individual that carries it, but beneficial to other individuals. So here it raises a, a distinct question of how can a traits like this ever spread? Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the, you know, a perfect example of the kind of question that the genes have used often. How can fatalism ever spread? And you're interested in exploring, uh, understanding that logic of how it can work. And that's why it's often quite fine with, with ignoring some of these kind of finer details of how that is actually accomplished at the, at the molecular level. And this, I think, go, comes back in a, in a lot of kind of debates over how the genes have you handle things like interactions between genes, mm -hmm. how it's often the kind of black boxes, how development actually works. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, one question that that leads to then is, is the genes have you sacrificing too much biological detail mm. in order to kind of preserve the, the the kind of the the value of being able to work out the the, the logic uh, of it mm. uh, and this is kind of like the, the, the definition about the length that I, 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 I wouldn't say that most of the genes that we aren't particularly concerned about what the length of a gene is because they're not they're not interested in understanding that it is this specific gene in this specific organism. Mm -hmm. They're interested in the kind of general question, can a gene mm -hmm. or set of genes, can that spread? They're interested in that question rather than uh, this understanding which specific gene in this specific organism that is. Because then you need to know exactly how long it is and what it's made up of. Yeah, and especially when we know about many things now about uh, various sequence that we have is that there's so many genes that are, you were talking thousands of genes that are contributing to a trait. So, so, so mm -hmm. one gene by itself is, is not really, uh, for, for at least an understanding of how we understand, you know, traits or certain markers, isn't really helpful. It's more of the confluence of, of all of these various genes that are going, working in tandem that say, ah, oh, okay. And, and again, it could be, um, not specific ones. I mean, they could, could be different ones for different people and so it's how do you know kind of these things about genetic switching and things like that but how do we understand how do all of these you know, hundreds of thousands of genes are contributing to um in tandem to you know one of these traits that we're interested in yeah very much so and, and if you're kind of interested in understanding the you know the, the genetic architecture of of a trait or kind of uh, how many of the genes are are, are involved what is the the, the average effect size of each specific uh, low side that you can identify. Is this a trait that's caused by many genes with small effects or a few with major mm -hmm. effects and, and, and so on? Then what you need to know about what a gene is, is rather quite different from when you want to set up a mm -hmm. theoretical correlation you know, like mm -hmm. model of, you want to understand under what circumstances can mm -hmm. uh, an allele with these kind of properties ever spread uh, in, the, in the population. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, 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 to generalize this point somewhat is that the uh, historian and sociologist of science, Ulika Sigestrole, who wrote a book called Defenders of the Truth, which was about the sociobiology uh, controversy, and in many ways, I think, remains probably the best book written about uh, that whole uh, kerfuffle. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and she also wrote a, a biography of uh, Bill Hamilton, mm. which is well worth reading. Uh, and she makes a distinction between kind of a logical and a literal tradition in, mm. in biology, mm. that a, a logical tradition has, is much more interested in exploring uh, and kind of under what circumstances can a trait like this ever uh, evolve? And if you kind of train in this tradition, you, you are quite comfortable with the asking the question, if I, if I was a gene, or if I was a flu virus, what would I do in this situation? And using this kind of heuristic of personification as a starting point to work out, um, and then perhaps you can formalize this kind of starting point in various ways down the line, but you're quite comfortable with, with this kind of starting point. And this is, in, she contrasts this with a, a literal uh, tradition, which is much more kind of common if you're trained in, say, molecular uh, biology or biochemistry, which is less about exploring potential scenarios and more about carefully describing the mechanism of a, of a process at, at hand. And then that kind of question of, if I was a gene, what would I do? It's not just uh, not helpful, but it's, it's um, basically absurd yeah, and, and not really a useful way of doing, uh, doing science. And I think the genes I view is it's kind of firmly in that kind of logical camp and it's interesting in, in, in exploring how things can evolve uh, rather than kind of specifically about in this in this uh, this instance here. Yeah, I, I really I really like that you're uh, underlining that because I think sometimes some of the uh, arguments or debates or what have you it, they become very granular, right? It's just this very like one specific thing. And look, there's there's a lot of value to spending some time on something very specifically or you know in the weeds, but I think if it misses, you know, kind of like you're saying with the group selection piece, if you're you're missing the whole uh, kind of whole menu of what's going on and where it sits within a context, you know, then you're you're, you're missing the forest from the trees, you know, whatever, you know, that you're you're not really getting. Um, the kind of not necessarily application, but just again, kind of more of the context of of wh why this is important or what it's contributing to other things. I mean, nothing's in a vacuum, right? Nothing's in a bubble, um, and and I, you know, you you illustrate that I think is is uh, super helpful. And 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 I think we, we as evolutionary biologists wrestle with that uh, all the time because you can be interested in whether uh, a factor A can 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 uh, cause variation in in this. Uh, trait uh, B, say, you can do an experiment in, in the lab to show that yes, A can, can cause a B. Uh, that may or may not tell you much about how much of natural variation in this trait B is caused by A. Uh, that, that may or may not uh, be a lot, or it can be a lot, or it can be a little. And whether it's a lot today may or may not tell us much about whether over evolutionary history, A has been an important uh, factor in driving variation in, mm -hmm. in this trait uh, B. Mm -hmm. And I think evolution biology constantly has to, to wrestle between the kind of general and specific in, mm -hmm. in, the, in, that, uh, in that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, you, you talk about uh, types or tokens, and then you also talk about what uh, Dawkins mentioned as replicators and vehicles. And so, so you just kind of give us the kind of overview about those you know, four different concepts and why they're important to understanding how we're a kind of survival machine and, and um, maybe we're just host for all of our genes and our bacteria, but how do you understand like replicators, vehicles, types, tokens, all that stuff? Yeah, so the, the, we tried starting with the, the type um, token uh, distinction. Uh, it builds on this kind of philosophical distinction between describing a, describing a class of objects is different from describing an individual instance mm -hmm. of that, uh, that class. Uh, and this comes down whether a, a single selfish gene, to, to use that language, is that is that a type or a token? So one way to think about it is that in a given human cell, how many mitochondrial genomes are there in there? Um, so one answer to that question is one: there are all all our mitochondrial genomes in the humans are genetically identical because right? they all come from uh, our mother and bar any. De novo mutations are going to be genetically identical. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of like there's one type uh, of, of that. Um, but if you think of it in terms of tokens, though, it's going to vary. In some mm -hmm. cells, it's going to be hundreds of them, or sometimes it even might be in the, in the thousands. And in some human cells, it will be 
a zero uh, mitochondrial uh, genomes. So that's going to be the, the, the token answer. And this comes into, it's somewhat of, of an abstract debate whether it's best to, to view the gene of the user view as a, as a uh, token. So in terms of this specific site in, in, the, in, the, in the genome, that is what you should think of, or is one gene, so to say, all the copies as they are spread out. And here, again, you come into this kind of abstract territory of genes as information versus genes as, as nucleic acids and so on. Okay. Now, so one reason why Dawkins preferred to talk in terms of uh, replicators rather than genes is that he kind of wanted to emphasize these properties of genes, that they are what is being replicated and passed on, and that they have these kind of uh, properties of being uh, faithfully transmitted in a way that an, an organism uh, is not hmm. vehicles then are the, the kind of the structures that houses uh, replicators hmm. so Dawkins you know, pushed this, this way of, of framing um, things and it was the and another one who did a lot in kind of clearing up the uh, the model around this debate was the philosopher David Hull who also he was kind of pointed out that this was kind of inherent in, in Dawkins' way of, of reasoning. Uh, so he also talked about replic the value distinction between replicators on the one hand, but uh, rather than talking about vehicles, he talked about interactors. Mm. And in a way that, that reveals an interesting point that uh, Hull preferred interactors because that's what organisms do, they interact with the, mm -hmm. the, the environment and, um, and uh, they are the ones that kind of play an active part, he, he argued in, in the, the, the theater of, of, of ecology. Now, so Dawkins, in contrast, preferred the term vehicle just precisely because it is a more passive term. Because uh, to him, the real action was at the level of replicators, and vehicles are more kind of this uh, uh, passive, um, uh, temporary uh, housing structures of replicators. And I think it's a subtle but quite kind of in, uh, subtle but uh, insightful kind of distinction. You already provide some insight to, to where you want to put the emphasis. Of it. Uh, now, of course, Dawkins sometimes also talk about things like survival machines, which is a, perhaps a more purple way of making uh, the same uh, point that uh, to him, but at the end of the day, he, he argued the, uh, the genes or the replicators are uh, what matters. Mm. Uh, but I think, kind of to tie it back to some of the discussions we have had previously, that it, replicators is, a, is another way to, to divorce it from any sort of material properties that it should, it shouldn't be tied to um, what, how it happens to, to work. And this also leads into that Dawkins has his, has his arguments about if you were to find life on other planets, uh, regardless of what the, the, the physical structure of that is, it will have something that plays a role of replicators, something that plays a role of vehicles. Mm -hmm. And that you can, uh, you know, you can have some discussion about whether evolution requires things to play the replicators and vehicles. And I think, I think while I think replication of vehicle is, is a useful one, it's a pretty useful one in the context of this debate, yeah. you, can, you don't need that distinction in order for evolution by natural selection to work. You just need to have some sort of inheritance uh, and that doesn't need to come in the form of, of, of replicators. What, what does it need? Is it, maybe I'm, 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 I'm uh, giving too much of a watered down version of this, but. I'm kind of hearing it as that replicators are more active and 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 pushing, and uh, vehicles are more passive and stagnant. And they're kind of providing the structure of how something's going around, but they're not really doing anything. And the replicators are the ones that are doing all the action and the work. You know, is, is that a kind of a too too much of a caricature of of that of that uh, distinction, or or is it something kind of like that? I mean, in some ways, I think that that, that, that is a, a fair description of, of the genes I view, and that you want to, it's a perspective of once it plays the emphasis on the, the replicators, and the replicators struggle for, uh, for survival. Uh, but that is, of course, also been a, a central point of contention that many other biologists would argue that it, at the end of the day, it is organisms that survive, it is organisms that reproduce. So to kind of put the emphasis on on replicators doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Is it like it's, it's only in virtue of organic survival reproducing that that replicators can do anything? Mm. Um, and I think that, that is partly a, a matter of of, 
of emphasis of, mm. of how, where you want to lay, 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 lay the, the emphasis of. I mean, I think the interview often has this kind of a, a rhetoric that, that, that is somewhat flowery to, to really put the emphasis on, on the, the, the properties of, of the replicators. But, uh, and that, that, that is really helpful for certain kinds of questions as, uh, as we see where, because uh, it, it particularly tells us about that not all genes in the normal instance are going to work for the same goal, that they may be in conflict with each other. It raises all this question about how did all instances become this well-integrated cohesive whole to begin with, uh, and, and so on. Um, perhaps I would say, like the, so I think the, the replicated vehicle distinction is, is a useful one to, to understand life on, on, on our planet. Um, I, I would say that the, the, the central weakness of it is that it, it often it, it, it assumes some of the properties that it's meant to explain, mm -hmm. and, and that and that is that you know both replicators and the fact that you can think of them as being stably inherited and so on, and vehicles as the as being these kind of cohesive poles, those properties of the replicators and of the vehicles are themselves product of mm. of evolution. So mm -hmm. at, at the kind of the earliest days of uh, the moments after the origin of life, those kind of things did not exist, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so then you may say like, well, by now they are. So for most of say eukaryotic life, at least, this is going to be a meaningful and helpful distinction. But it goes back to like, is it all that, that is not as general of a description of evolution as you can construct, because then you, you, you can't rely on, mm. on, on that kind of distinction. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really instructive. You had mentioned that uh, kind of just uh, along with this, you know, uh, Lloyd's four questions, right? You know, what is the replicator? You know, what's the interactor? You know, where is it ad adaptation manifest? You know, what is the beneficiary or, or selection? You know, what, what um, how do we understand how you, you kind of were just talking about some of the questions about like, what are these things? Uh, what are they actually? And, and, and then what are their utilities? So I don't know if you want to discuss a little bit about, you know, his four questions. Yeah, so, so here, here I think it is really useful to, to, to illustrate that a lot of these debates between all the, over the genes that you realize at the intersection between, on one hand, kind of theoretical evolution and biology, on the, on the other, the philosophy of biology. Because in addition to, to David Hull, uh, Elizabeth Lloyd was another one of these philosophers who really came to play a, a tremendously important role, kind of clearing up a lot of the uh, conceptual model mm -hmm. that existed over, over these issues. And she, she developed this kind of framework of that for any uh, instance of natural selection, you can ask uh, four separate, though related kind of questions. And the first one, what is the, uh, the replicator? The second, what, what is the, the replicator in, in this kind of case? So in most situations, we would say the replicator is going to be going to be genes. And the vehicle usually is going to be an individual organism, but could potentially be a group, mm -hmm. which is kind of, I think, goes to illustrate that while the genes I view grew out of a um, objection to group selection explanation, it mustn't be that, it's not necessarily so, mm. uh, that you can kind of construct an argument in terms of vehicles and replicators where the vehicle is the group, but the replicator is always the, the, the gene. Mm. And the third question that she identifies where, the, where adaptation is, is manifested. So again, it's usually going to be the, the individual organism because those are usually, usually the carriers of adaptation, but something may be a group uh, adaptation. Mm -hmm. And again, you can kind of separate that out. And then you can have a debate about whether uh, does, select, does adaptation at a given level require there to have been selection at that level and, 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 and so on. And, and, and that's, a, well, that's a separate question. Uh, finally, then, she, she defined what is the beneficiary of uh, selection. So it, 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 who, what, who benefits from this or, who, or um, who, what, if, what is an adaptation good for? Who is it good for? And here, the, the genes that we were talking about, the only answer to that can be the, the gene, because only the gene is being passed on or has the evolutionary longevity to, to, to kind of deserve to be the answer to this question. Mm. So I think this is a really useful way to, to separate a lot of these questions, because often people are interested in different kinds of questions. So you just kind of noting that people are. Because um, then you can kind of, once you've established that, you can have a separate discussion about which of these um, questions is more important, kind of a, a normative debate about whether is one question more important than the other. And the genes of view has put a lot of emphasis on that this beneficiary question is, is a really important, that is the key to understand natural selection. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like is by understanding the emphasis that 
that this this tradition has, has put on the beneficiary question, you can understand why so uh, keen to emphasize these kind of unique properties of, of, of replicated that, that, that can't be fulfilled by any other sort of biological entity. Mm, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. So one of the main features of uh, Dawkins was that he came up with the term meme, right, which is mm. now a, a pop culture reference now, which is not quite the same, but... Um, it's a great uh, meme in of itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So could you maybe tell us just what, what a meme in, in Dawkins' uh, original view is and you know how is it the replicator in cultural evolution? Uh, that they can create, but not like genes do. You just kind of explain the differences of like, first what it is and then the, the difference. Yeah, so, so meme was first introduced by Dawkins in the last chapter of the, of the first edition of um, all the selfish uh, gene. And it was introduced as a word to describe a cultural equivalent uh, of a gene. So a, an entity that will play the same role as a replicator does or gene does in organic evolution, you want something. You wanted to have something that play the same role in uh, cultural evolution. Now, the idea that you can apply, apply the Arrhenian principles to, to culture goes back a, a long way and kind of started pretty much as soon as, as Darwin introduced the, the ideas of of, of, of evolution. Uh, now, for Dawkins, then, because he has this argument that evolution requires these two distinct entities, something to play the role of replicator and something to call play the role of a vehicle is all in this. And if we have this very useful way of thinking about organic evolution, how should that look in cultural evolution? Here then is what, what where memes come in. Could you could you just yeah. give an example of one, uh, what a meme in cultural evolution looks like? Just as an example. Yeah, so I mean, so the, the example that he uses in the selfish genes are things like uh, tunes, catchphrases, mm. um, fashions. Um, you can even have more kind of, compl like kind of complexes of memes as, that would eventually lead into uh, political ideologies, religious ideas, and, and, and so on. But in a way, I think here, so as you will see, you, you will have seen in the book, I'm somewhat critical of mm -hmm. the whole notion mm -hmm. of, 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 of memes. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, but it reveals something interesting, and that there, there is somewhat of an irony lurking here, that uh, for Dawkins, the, the idea of a replicator was a way to liberate the concept from material basis of, 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 of um, nucleic acid, of, of, of DNA. But in many ways, I think that it's it, it exactly those kind of like unique features of how uh, inheritance works that means that it needs to be worked so well in organic evolution, but it doesn't work particularly well in cultural evolution. Mm -hmm. And this becomes like, you know, what, where, where does one meme start and where does the other one mean? So this kind of boundary issues, uh, th this issue arises in, in, when it comes to genes, but you can described in terms of biological processes like recombination and uh, crossing over. Uh, it's, well, while it's kind of clear how kind of replication means that you can kind of talk about the lineage of, of genes from one generation to another and this kind of do the kind of coalescence on analysis. Mm -hmm. While kind of one meme can, you can argue that it makes, makes give rise to, to another one, how this kind of lineage thing is going to work is also somewhat unclear. Um, similarly then like you know, things, you know, the, the kind of crucial to, to the idea of uh, the genes I've used, the idea that you have separate alleles and alleles competing for transmission. Um, what the role, what difference between alleles and, and, and genes, what that would be in, in, the, kind of in a mimetic world is also unclear. Mm -hmm. um, should, should I, I mean, Dawkins recognized a lot of these issues mm -hmm. to, to, to begin with. And, and I think a lot of the the more, uh, and a lot of people have, have ran with the concepts and, and applied it in, in various um, ways. Um, and cultural evolution is, is far from my expertise, but, but, uh, but it, might, it is my impression uh, fr from uh, talking to colleagues there that while memetics was a really useful in kind of like stimulating the field and moving forward in that it, it raised a lot of the right kinds of questions, there are kind of other approaches to the cultural evolution that, that dominates now that, that does not rely on this idea that you can break down culture in these three kind of replicator-like uh, replicator um, entities. Um, 
if a meme was trying to look at it, so kind of how a gene works or organically or a replicator rather in, in cultural evolution, such as, you know, various norms or certain things in culture and politics, et cetera. How is that, I guess, a little bit different than what he called the extended phenotype, right? Because we also see that play now. So how do we, I was going to ask this later, but since we're here, I want yeah. to know that the, the major distinction or difference between the extended phenotype versus the kind of a meme and so forth. Yeah, so, so a meme grew out of the idea that uh, you wanted something to play the replicator in cultural evolution. So, uh, the extended phenotype comes from the recognition that a gene may have a phenotypic effect beyond the physical body in which mm -hmm. it, it is located. Uh, and kind of classic examples of that would be the uh, examples of animal architecture. So the, the physical structures that animals build mm -hmm. that we believe to be, they, are, they, ha they have have a genetic components in, in the fact that they, they are being built. Mm. Um, so, you know, on the paperback edition of many uh, issues of the extended phenotype, you will see a, a beaver's dam, uh, which has often been the kind of textbook uh, examples, but also things like uh, the nests that uh, birds uh, make or the, uh, the burrows of, uh, of mice. Mm. And all these examples that you have a physical structure, so you have a phenotype in a sense, but that phenotype is outside of the, uh, the physical body. Uh, so you can kind of think of that, uh, but kind of this um, extended phenotype still then is gonna affect the selection on, on the genes uh, yeah. responsible uh, yeah. for it. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very, very helpful. Uh, I guess uh, here, um, you talk about the five uh, difficulties with the selfish gene idea, and I, you've already hinted at, at at least one of them. Um, so maybe we, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll list them off and then you can just kind of go through them because it was a really cool part of the, the chapter in the book, which the, the five difficulties that you list are anthropomorphizing, uh, epistasis, uh, bookkeeping, genetic determinism, which is a big one, and uh, human nature. So j just, just tell us, you know, the, the, how you came to these five difficulties with the selfish gene idea and, and kind of where we're at with that now, I guess. Yeah, so I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, a kind of a, a central motivation for wanting to write this book was to work out why this debate uh, persists mm -hmm. uh, over, over, over its value and why, why people disagree about it so much. And in many ways, this chapter, which is, is, a, is a full chapter that's kind of dedicated to some of the most common criticisms of the uh, the concept mm -hmm. of, 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 of the gene side view. Uh, in many ways, it was one of the most fun things to write because it, it touches upon so many parts of, mm -hmm. of evolutionary biology and why I think it's such a fantastically fun subject to, to study because you, you, you get to deal with so many parts of, mm -hmm. of science and its implications. So it's kind of starting from the top, the anthropomorphizing uh, is the, the, the criticism that, that basically comes down to that genes can't be, uh, can't be selfish. So and it's kind of silly to talk about genes in this kind of way. Uh, and this is kind of part of, of, of a bigger debate that goes back longer about the use of agential thinking uh, in, in evolutionary biology, which is kind of um, related to the, to the, the, um, the grand old sin of biology, of, of teleology, the kind of notions of, of, of purpose. And there's this kind of longstanding debate in, in the history of biology, whether the Darwin and the theory of evolution finally got rid of teleology from, from biology, or if he found a way to, to naturalize it, that made it okay to talk about the purposes. Mm -hmm. So this kind of first part of the chapter deals with how the genes I view is part of a tradition of identical thinking where you kind of, you put yourself in the shoes of mm -hmm. an entity and ask yourself, well, if I was a gene, what would I do? And how you kind of use that to, um, uh, as a starting point to come up with hypotheses about mm -hmm. Uh, about the evolution, and, and I uh, defend a version of what I call, or can be called, a license anthropomorphizing, is a term that I borrowed from, from Alan Graf, and that this kind of heuristic of personification is a very useful starting point, but then you want to formalize it in, in, in some way, and usually you can do that mm -hmm. with some sort of mathematical model. Uh, second thing about epistasis is, is, is this criticism that um, Often the interact. Yeah. Sorry, before before you go to the next one, I just want to one comment about that. When I read that part in the book about the anthropomorphizing, is in 
in my view, I mean, I understand where people take that very seriously. Okay, you don't want to see genes as actual agents to survive and reproduce and pursuing goals and all those things. But it kind of seems like a sort of consciousness raising kind of tool or it's a way of communicating science. Now, you don't want to do that where it's too confusing, where people are actually thinking, you know, genes are selfish in the way that we understand that. But I mean, trying to explain evolutionary biology to lay people is profoundly difficult. And so you need, you need to just describe it in ways that are understandable for people, that they can understand or get the idea that's being expressed. Obviously, you don't want that to go too far where people are literally walking around saying like, you know, my genes are selfish or whatever. But, you know, you, yeah. you want you want to have some way that people can tangibly grasp, you know, the concept. I mean, isn't that the utility of it? Yeah, so I mean, well, in a way, I think you can put it even in, in further. I don't think it's necessarily only useful to, to explain evolution to, to lay people. I think it can be useful among professional biologists as well. And I think anthropomorphizing is often one of those concepts that you have to unlearn and then relearn. Because mm. you, you're kind of, as a kid, kids are naturalized, natu natural at, naturally anthropomorphized all the time. And then you kind of you start studying biology more formally. You're taught that we don't do that. And then you come to graduate school and you realize that biologists do it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think often people who are in print are very critical of anthropomorphizing, do, do it in conversation all the time as well. And I think, so I, I think, I guess my opinion on it is that anthropomorphizing is, is a very helpful thinking tool a lot of the time, mm -hmm. but you, 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 you do need to, to be very careful with it because it can also lead you um, astray, I think, in, in certain ways, so that it, it can, it lends you to certain kinds of, 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 of explanation, perhaps better than, uh, than others. Mm -hmm. And also, you often, you always need to, to formalize it in, in some way, because yeah. it, it, yeah, yeah the, 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 um, so, yes, yeah, so I think it has a, has, a, has a potential to be more so than just popularizing, because yeah, I think yeah, biology is, is difficult. We need yeah. all the help we can get to, 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 to understand it, but right. uh, you, be, be careful and be, be, be wary. Uh, yeah. um, so yeah. I, think, I think it was Lewinson who said, or I can't remember who, who exactly, that the first time that the, the price of, uh, of metaphor is it, it, eternal vigilance that you always need to be very, very, very careful about uh, yeah. what, what it takes you. Yeah. So, so sorry, you were going on to uh, epistasis, right? I was going to say, so epistasis refers to the, to the, the phenomenon in, 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 in evolution by where you have um, interactions between genes, and that's especially interactions that are, are non-additive. Uh, um, and uh, this can be an issue for, for, for the genes of you, that, that the genes of you works best when you can kind of rely on an on average, averaging study, when you can kind of talk about the average effect of, uh, of an allele. And there are all sorts of reasons why this may not work, either because of population size or demography, uh, and uh, often the all possible combinations of alleles that you can imagine. If you imagine a, a genome and there are multiple alleles at each, at each uh, site, the combinations of alleles that you can try out are pretty much infinite. So it's very practically impossible to, to think of uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the average effect. Um, so, I think epistasis is a, is a serious limitation of the, uh, the, the gene psi view that a lot of time the interactions between genes are so complex that, it, that, that it's, uh, if you're interested in what the genetic architecture is of a specific uh, trait, you, you have to take into account uh, interactions between uh, genes and, and the genes that you can perhaps work best when those uh, interactions are uh, are uh, absent or at least rather rare. Mm. Uh, that being said, I mean, I guess like a common misunderstanding that you alluded to at, at the beginning is that that a gene set view assumes that all genes are selfish all the time, right. uh, whereas actually it, it can quite comfortably handle the fact that genes, most of the time, the best strategy for a gene is to, to cooperate with, with other genes mm -hmm. uh, right. in the genome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so going on to the, the, the third one, right? So, so we have the, the anthropomorphizing piece, okay, and then the epistasis, which is the, talks about the cooperation of genes and the interaction, yeah. and some of the context dependent. And then the, the third one is the, the bookkeeping uh, piece. So the, 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 yeah, the bookkeeping objection um, is uh, one of the uh, most classical objections to, to the genes of view. And this kind of goes back to the fact that 
just because you can describe evolution as a change in allele frequencies over time, which everyone recognizes that you can, that does not mean that genes are the best, uh, that our explanation are best described in terms of, of genes. Mm -hmm. That uh, instead, and so this, this is a, a point of view that was kind of popularized by, by Stephen Jay Gould, and it was kind of at the heart of many of his um, uh, criticisms of the concept. Uh, and he argued that actually, at the end of the day, it's, it is usually organisms that um, that interact with each other, the organisms that survive, the organisms that die, the organisms that reproduce. So our explanation should be in terms of um, of that. And also because you can have all these other things, you know, at a, at a macro evolutionary scale that may cause changes in allele frequencies, kind of these uh, chance events or mass extinctions and so on. Uh, again, that, that will be traceable mm -hmm. uh, as, as changes in early frequencies, but it's not appropriate to kind of causally talk about this in terms of uh, of genes uh, rather than in terms of uh, organisms. Mm. And, and where do you see, I guess, now? Uh, there, I, I think, uh, is is Gould? Is he passed? I think he's passed now, right? I can't, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I know Dawkins is is. Uh, He's, he's he's still alive. He's still writing books and putting them out. Mm -hmm. But um, where where do you where do you see? I guess currently where their kind of differences lay between Dawkins and, and Gould. I know they've had a kind of storied uh, relationship, you know, and and, and pretty uh, feisty with each other at certain points, you know, thirty years ago. But where do you just kind of see the the current differences now? They kind of really just just on two different sides of some of this stuff, or or how do you see it? I think the, the, the kind of reading about their disagreements over, over the years was a, a tremendously fun way to, to learn about the history of, <laughs> uh, of, of, of uh, evolutionary biology. It was, it's very well documented in, by mm -hmm. Kim Sorelli in a book called Dawkins versus Gold. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a lot of it, uh, so what I think it, it is interesting is a lot of the disagreements come down to uh, what is it that we are trying to do here? Like, what, what is the goal of, 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 of evolutionary biology? And like, mm -hmm. what are the important questions? And, you know, and, and I think like, you know, Dawkins came from this very much that adaptation is the central problem, mm -hmm. Gould with, with his background, and it is much more kind of in the, the, the grand trends of diversity and how that changed over time. They disagreed about not only what questions, but also what a good explanation looks like. Uh, in, in terms of at what level you want to describe it, what kind of uh, language you're comfortable using, and uh, how what a formal argument uh, looks like. Uh, so I think it's, it's a very fun historical starting point, um, uh, and you will learn a lot from, from reading uh, both of them. They were uh, arguably the, the two best writers of their, their generation yeah. and of uh, any generation. Uh, how much of kind of like if you go to to, the, to an evolution conference now and how many people think of in terms of those arguments I mean, less so uh, yeah. I, 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 I would say that the, the, the field has uh, uh, moved on i think they continue to have an influence just because they are two two such great uh, interactions to to the field but in some ways for me it it, it was the, the the disagreements between the two of them that was a really eye-opener for me and i think i tell this story in the book too that you know to overgeneralize a little bit that when I was a teenager, teenager, I was given a book by Dawkins, and I, my American friends that I met in grad school, had been given one of Stephen Jay Gould's, and kind of our, our starting point of mm -hmm. what we thought this whole field was about and what it was trying to do was rather different. Uh, mm -hmm. As a consequence, uh, that, that is probably um, pushing it a little bit, the, the influence of it. But I think it does highlight that uh, they disagreed on, on on so many of the kind of interesting part of, 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 of the field that uh, it's a fun way to, to start thinking about some of these issues. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I definitely would agree that, you know, people that are getting into this or, you know, maybe a high school student or a college student or something should definitely read both. I, I think it's, it's very, very important um, and, and kind of wrestle with, with that. So the, the fourth one, the big one, uh, is genetic determinism, right? Uh, this one gets a lot of you know, controversy nowadays still. Um, so we don't have to get into all of the controversy, but um, many people out there that are kind of strict hereditarians that say, you know, your genes are what they are and that's just how you're going to be in life and you can't really change, you can't do anything about it. 
So I guess I, the big question here for genetic determinism, and again, trying to root it based on the you know, selfish gene concept is, you know, how much do we understand now of genes being an interaction with the environment and not, again, just kind of in a vacuum or, or, or a bubble? How, how do we understand this genetic determinism uh, thing? Yeah, so I think the, the, the genes I view and was very much thrown into that debate over, over uh, genetic determinism as it kind of reaches heyday in probably in the, in, in, you know, in the, in the 1980s when the last big wave of, of that debate uh, came through. Uh, in particular, because the, the genes that we in particular Dawkins uses a kind of language about, you know, we are survival machines or lumbering robots, and the uh, the uh, survival of replicates are the, the ultimate rationale for our existence, and, and so on. Uh, that combined with kind of using a genes for language that you, you often talk about these kind of mm -hmm. thought experiments that you imagine a gene for trait X, and can that ever? Mm -hmm. uh, spread and so on, and that led to I think these are also being tied up with uh, accusations of, of genetic determinism. I, I think that 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 was uh, unfair. I think Dawkins, Mina Smith, a lot of these proponents were not determinist in, in that sense of of the uh, the world. I think they were comfortable with genes had things to do with. Uh, with phenotypes and including in in in, in humans, but I, I, I've always thought a lot of this debate is somewhat tangential to to the interesting debates of over over the gene side view, and this is um, perhaps it's a consequence of that the gene side view was unwillingness to uh, deal with um, development and how kind of genes actually connect to to phenotypes, which uh, the gene side view never really is particularly concerned with. Uh, it's, it's all about uh, these kind of logical scenarios can, can a gene fully spread and then how that is actually implemented is some uh, secondary. Um, so the way I always thought about it is that it was kind of caught up in, in a historical moment much more so than, than particularly being a, um, uh, a contribution to it. But I mean, again, reading history, there's some memorable uh, defenses there both from, from Dawkins, but even more so perhaps uh, John John Maynard Smith, very much of the man of the man of the left, uh, who who also accused her of all, all, all sorts of things, and he used his full uh, rhetorical repertoire in in in, uh, in standing up for himself, which if nothing else is rather uh, fun to to read. Yeah, and uh, the fifth point here about the selfish uh, gene is the human nature. You know, how can we understand the genes I view, and how they Im how genes impact human behavior, and and maybe some of the more <laughs> bleak aspects of our humanity. Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's kind of one reason why, why the debate over genes is such a fun kind of window into a lot of aspects of, of evolutionary theory. And I think this kind of um, relates to how we view our, our position in, 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 in the universe, if, if you will, in the sense that because mm -hmm. evolutionary theory in a way is a story about us and how we came to be. So kind of if we think of evolution as ultimately being about, you know, um, selfish uh, replicators competing for uh, transmission. If that's the, our story, what does that tell us about uh, how we as, as human are, humans are and about what the universe, uh, the universe is in, in general? Uh, I think there's some interesting parallel. I mean, both Dawkins and even more so Williams, I must say, had a, a rather bleak view of uh, of evolution by natural selection, and Williams described uh, natural selection as a wicked old witch, uh, and and they both had these kind of arguments that you can't really make any, you can't take any kind of um, solace from how the way evolution works. You can't use that as a starting point for how we should organize our society, and you can kind of see some really interesting parallels between Williams and and T.H. Uh, uh, Huxley. Mm -hmm. He also had a pretty, pretty, pretty bleak view, and, and Williams was very interested in, in, in Huxley and actually organized the kind of republication of some of his works and, and you know, wrote the introduction to some edited collections of, of, of his papers. Uh, and there, again, is, is his argument that natural selection is an awfully cruel uh, process, so uh, we shouldn't use that in any way to, to design our, uh, our, our society. Mm. Yeah, no, no, that, that's that's 
It's absolutely uh, fantastic. And I, and I think that the biggest thing with, with this whole you know, major section here in, in your book is that you, you give a, a uh, I would say the whole book, right? Read this, but, you know, obviously Dawkins is mentioned a lot in, in your book uh, because of how kind of momentous he is in, in, in evolutionary biology, but you, you give a very balanced kind of account of like, here's, here's some really, I mean, this is what made it legendary. This is what made it so monumental. But here are some challenges. Here are some potential weaknesses here. And here's where we've kind of progressed and evolved within uh, biology on how to, to build off of that. And so I think it strikes a, a very, very nice balance. Um, yeah, I'm happy to hit that. I mean, I think I, I wouldn't have written this book if I didn't think that the genes of yours had a large positive contribution to, to evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. um, th th that being said, th this is a debate that has had so many brilliant uh, polemicists contribute mm -hmm. on both, mm -hmm. both sides. And I don't think that's what the debate needs. But so for me, it was much, uh, what I was trying to do is just to show how kind of sprawling and, and, and nuanced this debate has become. Because often I've been frustrated by mm -hmm. uh, um, colleagues on bo both sides, mm -hmm. uh, both among professional colleagues and, and I mean, lay people who either will tell you that genes have used the only way to think about evolution and everyone knows that, or they will tell you that the genes have used been um, debunked and mm -hmm. uh, everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I kind of want to show that there's uh, uh, good, good, good arguments on both sides um, uh, being made, both in the, the biological and, and perhaps also in the, in the philosophical uh, literature. Yeah, yeah. So on the, the last major point, which is basically the last you know, third of the book here, is you talk about inclusive fitness, which is something that many people have uh, d discussed at obviously various points. Uh, you talk about uh, Hamilton. We, we've already alluded to extended phenotypes. You talk about it here. So I guess the, the you, you do this really, I mean, again, it, it's a very balanced book, which I, I really like, but it... it uh, you find this nice middle ground with Hamilton's framing of things, uh, especially because these are kind of these two camps again. Everyone likes to have a side they're on. So first, tell us what's Hamilton's rule and how does that impact our understanding of altruism? Uh, so what we now call uh, Hamilton's rule is this simple uh, inequality for uh, when we should expect a trait to be favored by natural selection, mm -hmm. and it's often written in an abbreviation of something like RB is greater than, than C, where B is simply its, its benefit and C is the cost. And this benefit then is scaled by a relatedness. Mm. And this becomes especially helpful when we want to understand the spread of uh, social traits, interactions between individuals. And uh, especially so when those traits, social traits are uh, harmful or reduces the fitness of the individual performing them, but uh, benefits individuals is the recipient of those social uh, traits. So it leads to this uh, general prediction that relatedness or kinship is going to be a central part of our explanations of, of, of social uh, behavior. Um, and it, this is an inequality that, that Hamilton first introduced in, in this little note in uh, 1963 and then expanded upon in the following year in this really majestic two-part paper uh, on uh, where he also introduced what is known, is known as uh, this concept of inclusive uh, fitness, um, which is a idea of how you can uh, do the uh, sums for when you want to account for fitness of uh, that involves social uh, interactions uh, where you kind of uh, you strip away any part of your own fitness that is due to the, the social environment, but then you also add on to, to, to that fitness and uh, that that you have caused in the individuals around you scaled by by their by their relatedness. So, and this is this is a quote. Uh, yeah, no, I was gonna say so okay. it sounds like there's an interplay between it. So I'm giving something up of myself to put it out there for the the either the group or what whatever is, is is there and then I'm receiving also another benefit of it. Is is that is that the is that how it works? So that, that becomes part of, of kind of how these kind of behaviors often work. Hamilton mm. was kind of interested in how can you uh, do the kind of the accounting of, of this mm. and kind of how can you kind of like partition the, the fitness. So you, you, if you have a, 
if you have an, a, a situation where you um, can affect the, the fitness of individuals around you and those individuals can also uh, affect the fitness of, of you. Mm -hmm. So they can help you have some more strength, but you can also help other individuals have more strength. How do you, how do you kind of sum that up? That is important then to first account for that. Uh, it's perfectly causally appropriate to uh, account for some of the options that you had. Actually, that kind of causally belongs to someone else. Mm -hmm. But also the fact that you had kind of causal responsibility from uh, for, for other individuals having an increased number of offspring. So you want to like add the, the other individual's fitness to part, part of yours, but also subtract some of the, the fitness of, of you from to, that is accounted for by uh, the individuals that were causally responsible for that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, doing this kind of mass of the concept of inclusive fitness is uh, hard often. It's, it gets into to the weeds. This and, is the, the part of the book where you had like the formula that was put in there. That's, that's part of it, and it's kind of that, 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 there, there I introduce the kind of what is sometimes known as the uh, modern version of, of, of deriving uh, mm. Hamilton's rule, um, which owes a lot to, uh, to Dave uh, Queller. Uh, and, but even so, in, in, so Hamilton's 1964 paper, this two-part paper, is notoriously difficult to, to, to make your way uh, through. It, 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 and the as far as we can tell, the first time the, the term selfish genes uh, appears is in the, uh, the lecture notes uh, that Dawkins developed in, in, in 1966 when he was asked to take over the uh, animal behavior lectures um, when his uh, advisor, Nico Timbergen, was away on sabbatical. Mm. So Dawkins at this time was very young, so he, he typed up his, his lecture notes to kind of, especially when he was going to navigate the, the rather tricky waters of, of ham inclusive fitness concept. And this then it's the first time if you go back to these notes, you can say this is the first time he describes genes as you expect them to behave as they are, mm. as if selfish. Mm. Because Hamilton, and this is kind of a crucial part, is that Hamilton in that first 1963 paper uses a gene side view point of view. He, he describes that the, the crucial thing is not if this behavior is pretty good of the behavior, but if it's good for the gene underlying those traits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas inclusive fitness, on the other hand, is, is a property of the individual. And um, the, and I go into the details of, of this debate in, in the book, but one part of the debate over inclusive fitness as well is whether inclusive fitness, you can make it so that it's this unique property that is on the, con the control of the individual in your thinking of individual as should, they should be uh, designed as if they're trying to maximize their inclusive fitness. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you can kind of locate this property inclusive fitness to an individual and is fully under the course of control of the individual is one something that like proponents of, of the concept think of as, as, a, as a great advantage uh, of it. Um, so in the book, I, I try to tease this relationship between a, a dean's eye view and inclusive fitness, mm -hmm. both that there's this kind of um, historical connection because some of the key, the people who were involved in the, the, the two concepts were, were the same and often um, interacted. Um, but that from the Dean's ideas point of view, sometimes there's been this frustration that Hamilton in some ways did not complete his own revolution, that he showed that you can think of these properties from a Dean's eye view, but he also um, persisted in framing his explanation in terms of uh, individuals or individual fitness in terms of, or individual inclusive fitness maximization. Mm -hmm. And you can, you have some fun quotes from both Richard Dawkins and John Mayer Smith bemoaning uh, the fact that uh, Hamilton did not stick to his kind of gene-centric uh, exp explanations. Um, Before I, I get to kind of the, the, the connection between the two, I, I'm just curious if he had a, at least initially started out with the, the genes I view of things and then kind of moved more and when he gets to inclusive fitness about the individual, how, how does his view fit into what we know about kin selection or kind of what you were saying earlier this, this sounds very much like kind of a, a sort of reciprocity or interdependence um, and then obviously again with cooperation how does how do we understand hamilton's ideas from his, you know, his papers and his work with those other concepts that we understand you know cooperation kin selection interdependence etc reciprocity etc yeah so here is kind of thinking of the, the order on which things up here becomes quite insightful because there's a lot that happened there at the beginning of the 19, 1960s so hamilton as graduate student was working on this big paper that eventually would become his 1964 paper, and he had sent this um, to uh, for, for for review, and a uh, reviewer, and the reviewer now known to be 
John Maynard Smith had suggested that he uh, split the paper into two. And that took Hamilton quite a long time to rewrite the paper into kind of two parts. So often you talk about part A and part B on, the, on this big paper. Uh, in the meantime, uh, two things happened. So one, uh, Hamilton's um, PhD advisory committee suggested that, that he write a kind of a short preface of that paper. And that is kind of what was published in, in 1963. It's a short note to in the American Naturalist, where he introduced this inequality um, or a form of the inequality that we now know as, uh, as Hamilton's rule. In the mean, another thing that happened around the same time was that uh, John Maynard Smith wrote a paper for Nature where he um, introduced the term kin selection. Uh, so that is not Hamilton's term, but it's a term of John, uh, John Maynard Smith. And uh, Maynard Smith uses that to distinguish between, on the one hand, group selection explanations, and on the other hand, kin selection uh, explanations. And, uh, Bill Hamilton famously was very unhappy with how many Smiths handled this, and um, uh, he, he never really warmed to the term uh, kin selection. And, and even though today kin selection and inclusivity is often used interchangeably, in, in I can think somewhat of an unfortunate way because they do refer to separate uh, concepts. Uh, how that relates to, so how all these kind of concepts. Uh, Interrelate. So, kin selection is often uh, probably about how um, selection involving uh, relatives. Uh, interdependence, I think, is, is, a, uh, mine is a kind of concept of how the fitness of one individual depends on that on the other. Uh, often, what underlies that, I think, is, is kinship, but you can kind of construct models that, as long as, so a lot of things you need to, for cooperation to evolve in, in, in a model is that the fitness of one individual depends on that of another and that cooperators are more likely to, to interact with each other than with uh, non cooperators in the population. Now, kinship is going to be uh, a really powerful, powerful way to, to achieve that, um, but it's not the, the, the only uh, uh, way. So often they can uh, end up playing kind of the same role. Um, so in, in terms of of understanding kind of Hamilton's view with fitness and our current understanding of genetics, you offer a kind of, in my view, a, a very, uh, not a, not a either or, but kind of a both and, and you kind of give this kind of balanced way of understanding it. So explain how you kind of hold both of these ideas in your mind and, and, and say, okay, here's, both of these are important. Here's how, uh, how we can, we can think about it, you know, currently. So I think part of the, the, the issue over the, the current debate over inclusive fitness uh, has been about what we want the concept to, to achieve. So we, we have known for a long time, essentially, or the theoretical population genesis pointed out really early on that the mathematics of, of Hamilton's work isn't, uh, isn't super well, it doesn't hold together super well all the time and that they're all this kind of uh, weaknesses to it, uh, and particularly when, when it comes to assumptions about additivity or, or genetic uh, effects. Um, and there are ways you can kind of get around this um, to, by making some other uh, assumptions. And so you can make Hamilton's rule kind of hold and um, hold in all scenarios and get individuals to, to uh, maximize their, their inclusive uh, as if they're maximizing their inclusive fitness. Um, so part of the debate is kind of by recognizing these limitations of Hamilton's work, does that mean we should abandon it or not? Mm -hmm. And I think um, we can recognize that it has these limitations, but we can also recognize that the general, ver so th th this is kind of where the debate becomes somewhat technical, that the general version of, of Hamilton's rule, as kind of developed by Dave Queller and, and others, has these properties that you can often take more uh, precise models of a social scenario that involves specific biological mechanisms. And you can kind of translate those back into the general uh, mm -hmm. Hamilton, Hamiltonian or into Hamilton's rule and partition it out into mm -hmm. the kind of RB greater than C. Um, and they, by doing so, you can see commonalities between different kinds of, uh, of, of, of social evolution models. And that, that can be really quite helpful. Um, Another thing where uh, Hamilton's work can be really helpful is that I think depends on whether we, how strongly we believe that 
the kind of the appearance of design or adaptation is the central question. So the, the way I understand the history, I think, is that inclusive fitness is another part. The genes I view in inclusive fitness theory has this part common that they take adaptation to be the central problem. And inclusive fitness then becomes a property that what indiv individual organs should appear designed as if they're trying to maximize. Uh, and here's kind of where the genes have you and inclusive fitness have in some ways been seen as two sides of the same coin that um, for a, a gene selectionist is about gene survival, the genes trying to like pass on, but at, and that's at the replicator level. But then at the, the vehicle level, it's about individual organisms maximizing their inclusive fitness. So this can be two sides of the same uh, coin then. Um, and I think that, that I think kind of makes sense. And I think often from the inclusive fitness point of view, uh, proponents of inclusive fitness have often viewed it even more so this way. I think my impression is that sometimes Dawkins is kind of wayward in this, that he often he highlights this, but often sometimes, I mean, most recently in his autobiography, uh, describes inclusive fitness as the, you know, a last ditch attempt to save the individual organism as a central unit of explanation in, in, in evolution. Uh, and again, I think it kind of goes back to the frustration that we should just kind of just talk about, talk about it in terms of, uh, in terms of genes. Uh, so in the book, I also I tried to make this point that if you just read some of these criticisms or comments that Dawkins and John Maynard Smith makes about inclusive fitness, if you didn't know who made them, they sometimes sound surprisingly like some of the, the modern critics of uh, inclusive fitness theory. You also, you also say that inclusive fitness is, 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 is messy and complicated and we're better off just thinking in terms of, in terms of genes. But um, it's also my impression that I, neither of those two uh, groups would, would want to recognize much uh, uh, kinship with each other. I mean, look, I mean, I'm not a, a biologist, but uh... <laughs> you know, that two sides of the same coin seems very, very nice. I, I don't, I, it, it, not only is it like complementing or, or, or fusing together these two ideas, but it seems to be more holistic of sorts and, and that it's trying to, to, you know, cause people are, are tapping into things at, at one point in time and they don't have all of the technology or all the information or all of the science that's been done. And it, and a lot of the times this stuff is just reformed or built off of, but it doesn't completely, you know, take it out completely. Um, and so I think that in my mind, that kind of middle way makes a, makes a, a lot of sense. I wanted yeah, I to, it's a, yeah, sorry, as I, as, I, as I alluded to, I'm often quite comfortable with, with the fact that in biology, we, we will have different uh, ways of, of explaining the same thing, different ways of carving out reality and that they will kind of highlight slightly different things of the, the property. So I think it's kind of both, I think we kind of explore that you can explain it in this way, or you can explain it in that way. Uh, but I think we should also spend some time trying to like integrate between different models and see how how strong actually are the ties between these different ways of of, uh, of describing things? Uh, so 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 I guess the the other piece here we we mentioned earlier the extended phenotype and you talk about that there's three types of the extended phenotype and and how uh, the genes I view fits there maybe just you know, kind of briefly kind of explain to us I, I I've read the extended extended phenotype a very long time ago uh, it's it's been a while. So I can't remember if these three types are in that book. I imagine they are in that book, um, but just kind of tell us what the, the three types are and, and how the genes I view is, 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 uh, is implicated in that. Yeah, so I think the, the I think the genes, the, the extended phenotype is the, the best of, of Dawkins books. It's the one book that is written that was aimed at professional biologists mm -hmm. rather than at the, at the general audience. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, it's a book that can be uh, is written in such a way that can be un understood by, by anyone willing to put in the, the work. Um, it is also the most ambitious articulation or defense of the gene side view and, and kind of the, the implications of it. And the uh, central argument that he lays out is, as he described, to trying to free the selfish gene from the conceptual prison of the individual organism, as, as he puts it in the, in, in the introduction. And kind of Crucial to this then are various phenomena that doesn't really make sense from, it's hard to explain from the perspective on the individual organism, but 
makes more sense from, from the perspective of, of genes. And, and a kind of crucial part of them is, is our, the notion of extended phenotypes, as we, which we noted is the kind of traits or phenotypes that are located outside of the physical body in which a gene finds itself. Mm -hmm. And this is, comes in all shapes or forms, and you can kind of divide up in various ways. So I, I use kind of mostly for, for, for historical presence, I follow the one that, uh, that Dawkins uh, used, and he describes so the, so the first categories are what he calls animal architecture. Mm -hmm. so this would be your, your beaver's dam or your, your bird's uh, yes. nest. Mm -hmm. Second one is what he called action at a distance. So here's kind of examples of um, manipulation of the behavior of other organisms. So kind of a good example of this is uh, brood parasitism. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of birds that lay their eggs in nests of other bird species and uh, kind of tricks those uh, individuals from the other species to raising their young. So kind of the, um, like cuckoos is the kind of typical example of this and that can lead, which is uh, well um, studied, they've been known for a very long uh, time and to lead to this you know, the, the cuckoo is often much bigger than the, the host species. Which, so you can find fantastic images on, on the on the internet if you Google it of this little um, newly hatched cuckoo who's bigger than the uh, the, the, the host uh, parent. <laughs> um, but this kind of manipulation then is what he describes as action uh, at a distance, hmm. and it describes as kind of action at a distance to contrast that with the third kind of category, which also involves a form of uh, behavior manipulation, but this time from inside of the organism. So typically, then uh, parasites manipulating the behavior of of, an, of a, a uh, of a host. Mm. So a kind of gruesome and charismatic example of this is so-called zombie ants, which are infected by these kind of fungal mm -hmm. uh, parasites that uh, causes not only the, uh, the the ant to to move to a different part, so to move into a part that's quite dangerous for the ant to live in, but it's really good for the, the fungi to, to grow. And then the whole kind of gruesome affair ends with the, the, the fungi kind of growing through the head of the, uh, the, the ant uh, in order to, 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 to spread, uh, after, to, to reproduce. And there, there are other examples of this kind of parasites manipulating the, the behavior of, of an organism. So that would be the third category. So you would have kind of animal uh, architecture, uh, action as a distance and, and the, the parasite manipulation of uh, of host behavior. So kind of the three kind of categories, broad categories of of extended types. And and where in in that uh, in those three types, where does the genes I view fit here? Right? How how do we understand these phenomenon uh, of you know kind of outside the organism from a genetic perspective as opposed to maybe from a a, a different perspective? Yeah, so the, so the central notion then is that a, a, um, a, um, the one way to think about it is that the, 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 the uh, phenotype is, uh, is going to, or a phenotype or a behavior is going to be favored uh, by natural selection, uh, regardless of whether the, the gene causing that behavior or trait is located in the same body mm. as where that is being manifested or not. So it's, it's a way of kind of removing the, the kind of the layer of the organism and just thinking about a gene has these properties, will it be positively uh, selected or, mm. or not? Mm. And, uh, by, and then thinking that the, 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 uh, the um, causal effects of, of the genes radiate beyond the, the physical structure in which it finds itself, but can also be. So the, the behavior of the the ant, when it's infested by the, the parasite, uh, there is a genetic uh, basis for that, but the, the genetic base of that is not in the ant, but it's in the, the parasite itself. Mm. Or the same thing for the kind of the, the um, mm. there is a, uh, when it happens at a, at a distance in, as in, in the cuckoos, there's a genetic basis for this, but it's not. Um, or so take, take the cuckoo's nest, sorry, the, the, a bird's nest, there's a genetic basis for that, but it's not in the, in the, in the twigs of the right. of, of the nest, but it's in the in, in the bird that, that, yeah. that builds it. So that, that's kind of the, the conceptual uh, mm -hmm. point. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. That's great. A uh, few few last things here. You, you mentioned in the book, and and maybe I've heard it before, or or it just didn't like jump out to me. It was this strange term called green beards, which I I, I, I maybe I've heard it before, but it just didn't ring a bell. 
and it's a strange uh, term and, con and concept. So, you know, what are these, and and uh, why are they important? Um, so, green beds. The, the term itself um, was coined by uh, by Dawkins, and the, but the idea comes from uh, from Bill uh, Hamilton, mm -hmm. and in, in a way, it's, it's a good way to illustrate the difference between. Um, Inclusive fitness and, and, and kin selection. So kin selection is about the kind of the genome-wide relatedness between two, two, two individuals. Mm -hmm. But actually, for kind of for for Hamilton's rule to work, what, what matters is the relatedness at the gene or genes that are responsible for that social behavior, not the kind of genome-wide average mm -hmm. relatedness. Mm -hmm. So this starts as a thought experiment then that uh, Dawkins asked you to, to imagine a, a gene or a set of tightly linked genes that has uh, three properties. The first is that it gives the, the, bear, the, it gives the individual who, who has the gene a, a green beard. It gives the, 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 the individual the ability to identify other individuals that has a, a green beard. And, and thirdly, the, the, to behave nepotistically or altruistically towards those individuals that have shared a, a green beard. Mm -hmm. And what you can show then is that this this gene can be be uh, favored then by natural selection, even though you will have kind of this kind of cooperation not between relatives necessarily, but just because you share that specific gene underlying uh, mm -hmm. this this trait. Now, this is a thought experiment, and because you you, you also thought about like how can a gene or a set of genes have do all of these three things at the same time? So they're rather implausible. So it's kind of thought of as just kind of a a neat way to, to illustrate that what matters is um, the relatedness at the, the particular uh, locus or loci involved in social behavior, not necessarily the genome-wide one, though those are often going to be end up being the same things in, in, in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, we now know that there, there are a couple of examples of these kind of green beds, particularly in uh, microbes. Mm. So one of my favorite examples comes from uh, yeast. Mm. So in, in yeast, uh, they uh, perform this kind of flocculation or kind of clumping behavior when subjected to environmental stresses. So they come together in these kind of clumps, and then the, the individuals at the center of the, the, the clump will be kind of physically shielded from whatever environmental uh, stress that are on the, the outside. So the, kind of indivi the individuals at the, the edge or the surface of, of the clump acts as kind of a, a shield towards that. So this, for example, happens during beer brewing. So it was kind of a phenotype that was well, re well recognized by, by beer brewers, but because lab strains of yeast typically do not uh, manifest this uh, behavior, it took a while to work out the, mm. the genetic basis of it. Mm. But um, when doing so, it was recognized that the kind of a key genes here, this flocculation gene, flow one, behaved as a green bed locus. And uh, you can show that by taking multiple strains of, of um, of yeast. Uh, so we actually used this as a basis of a uh, undergraduate lab at, at, at University of Toronto when, when I was a graduate student. So we had the, the undergraduate students uh, do this lab where they took three strains of, uh, of yeast and they, they mixed them in the, in the same uh, test tube. And uh, they had two strains that were from the same species. And then you had a, a third strain that was from a second species. Hmm. Um, uh, and then you have them do all these kind of predictions about who, what strains do you expect to, to mm -hmm. cooperate and so on. And having you just learn about kin selection, they usually uh, predict the two from the same species. But actually what happens in, in this is that you have one of these strains that are from uh, species A has the same green beard as the, the third strain from species mm -hmm. B. So it had the same uh, flow one locus. Mm -hmm. So when you subject them to, to stress them and they form these kind of flocks or clumps, um, the two strains that form that come together are the two strains from different species, but share that same locus. That's why. Um, so, 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 so it's a neat example that it's not the genome-wide relatedness that matters in this case, um, but it's actually here, it's the, it's the relatedness at that particular uh, mm -hmm. locus. Right. And the kind of microbe seems to be, seems to be when it, it's rare in nature in general, um, but when it does happen, it seems to be that perhaps uh, it is in those kind of social, uh, social microbes where, where it does uh, happen yeah that that's super fascinating that's absolutely fascinating yeah I, I was not familiar with the term or or and so it was, it was very interesting so you, you explained it very nicely that's a fascinating example so we talked about way in the beginning of the conversation about how the genes i view is not the only way to understand evolution or adaptation or environment but i guess my question is is 
you know, how can we effectively understand the interaction between genes and the environment uh, for all organisms um, at the genes I view and, and, and beyond that? Um, I, I feel like many people feel these are in opposition or something like that, and, and, and they aren't. But how do we effectively understand that interaction between genes and, and the environment? And, and, and what can the genes I view of it at least tell us about that interaction? Yeah, so um, I, I can see that um, concern that the, I think one fair criticism of, of the genes I view is that if we think too much about you know, the question that we tend to ask ourselves is if, if I was a gene, what would I do? And I think that it's a perspective that lenses have really well for certain kinds of questions. It works really well to understand things like extended phenotypes and green beards and genomic conflicts, for example, which has been my bread and butter for, for, to understand for, uh, to study for many years. Uh, it can be perhaps hard if we, we're interested in about how organisms adapt to, the, to their environment. So if you kind of you do an experiment where you take uh, you put take plants from various different uh, that you have sampled from across a distribution range, and you put them in the same environment, you're not, you, and you want to understand you know why do uh, the the plants that you took from this area do better than the ones you took from another. How you sort of going to the genes have you be then? Well, maybe then you're better off in thinking in terms of individual organisms. And when you do think about genes, you want to understand about not only what genes you have, but also how these genes interact with the with the environment. And I think the genes have you can handle it, but for a specific in all certain scenarios, it may not always be the most powerful way to to think about. Uh, to think about things. Mm. So, I mean, if there's one kind of central argument running through the book is that I think that the genes of view of evolution is a tremendously powerful way to think about evolution. It's a very helpful thinking tool. But like all tools, you kind of must understand, to get the most out of it, you must understand what it was designed to do. And this is why I think it's really important to understand the history of it. That mm -hmm. is a concept mm -hmm. that's been particularly interested in understanding uh, adaptations, and it's been interesting kind of answering this kind of beneficiary question of, of natural selection to use mm. Elisa Lloyd's uh, vocabulary. Mm. So in a lot of questions, if you're interested in, in what uh, kind of, so it, 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 it achieves this success, the success is had in particular study of social evolution, study of altruism, study of genomic conflict and so on. It has also achieved that perhaps by ignoring other details Hmm. Ignoring the, the complications that arise from interactions between genes, epistasis. It often has kind of black boxed how development actually works. So when those those are really can become really important, for example, when you want to understand the interaction with a specific environment, then the, the genes have you loses some of its uh, potency, uh, hmm. I think, hmm. in the in these kind of ways. So that's why I think it is so important to 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 kind of constantly kind of think about. Um, where our, our, our modes of thinking come from. Uh, and that's perhaps another thing that I should add. I think that the genes that you occupy this rather peculiar position in theoretical biology, in, in that it's, it's not a straightforward empirical hypothesis, mm -hmm. though that can be kind of rejected or verified, that it can certainly help us come up with such. Mm -hmm. It's not the kind of a general mathematical framework that you can develop formal versions of parts of the, the argument. Instead, it's this kind of strange way of thinking, mm -hmm. a kind of way of kind of conceptualizing everything. It's a framework, yeah. yeah. It is a, it's a general framework that may or may not be useful in specific situations. Mm -hmm. And I think especially then because it's, it's married to this very powerful metaphorical thinking about selfish gene and so on, I think that is a, is a very helpful way in, in, in that it tickles our imagination and it mm -hmm. makes us help us uh, think about difficult things. But like with all metaphors, you should always be concerned not only about what questions it makes us ask, so, uh, but also what questions that go unasked, mm -hmm. like if it, mm -hmm. if, so that we can, it makes us perhaps overlook um, certain things. Mm. So I think with the interview, uh, like with all of these kind of more general ways of thinking, you ought to be, um, you, you always need to, to be remind yourself of not being too carried away uh, mm -hmm. with it. Yeah, it reminds me of the uh, the article you just wrote for say, Aeon. 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 Yeah. Aeon. It's uh, the article is called "An Idea with Bite." Um, and you said, yeah, that, that wasn't mine. That, that that's yeah, that's there. <laughs> yeah, but the the article is is great though. Um, you you write really well. Uh, I kind of see it as like an additional 
kind of a piece of the book um, in some ways about why the, the selfish gene is, uh, is an important tool for, for, for clear thinking. And uh, you just, you know, kind of outlined uh, why it should be used as a tool, but like all tools or, or, or type of framework, you know, it's not to be all end all and it's not going to be prescriptive necessarily, but it, it provides a kind of lens uh, of how we can understand many of, of uh, these components. Yeah, so and, and, and very much in the, for, for that essay for Aeon, I kind of really wanted to emphasize that aspect of, of the, mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. the book. The book otherwise is, is quite concerned with um, really kind of working out the, the working out, ironing out the kinks of some sometimes quite technical uh, disagreements. But I also think that there is this bigger uh, story about here how biologists think about uh, what we're trying to do. And I think the genes have you is, is such a interesting way into that issue and i kind of yeah really wanted to emphasize that um is that that unique role of the genes interview as being a but at the same time very influential but also quite contentious way of, of making sense of of the world yeah the last question here is is you know where do you see the future of the genes i view uh moving forward you know in understanding evolutionary uh, frameworks of various organisms, you know, where do you see work being done, either work that you're doing or work that, you know, colleagues and other people, you know, are doing about with genetics or just the genes I view in general about how we understand, you know, biology or, you know, sociology or just evolution in general. How, where do you see, see this kind of research going? I think that because it is this kind of general framework of thinking, I think it will continue to have an influential Role. I think many will many of us will continue to find that it's a very very powerful way to um, organize uh, our thoughts and kind of make sense of a wide variety of, of phenomena. I think that it's it's, it's perhaps especially uh, useful in the, the part of genetics that I've uh, spent most of my time thinking about, and that, that is the, the study of so-called selfish genetic elements and. Mm -hmm. uh, and genomic conflicts. So genetic elements was this idea that had been known as various things throughout history. Uh, they become ultra selfish genes or selfish DNA, parasitic DNA. Mm -hmm. So these are genes that are not just selfish in the kind of Dukinsian way of, of, of the world, a word that all genes are selfish, but are actually selfish in, in a more kind of in your face kind of way in that they mm -hmm. often then break the rules of the Mendelian rules of inheritance or have ways of promoting their own transmission at the expense of, of other genes, or even they can, may even reduce the fitness of the individual organism, but make sure that themselves always get uh, passed on. And this is a phenomenon that now we recognize is, is plays a major role in, uh, in most eukaryotic uh, genomes, various forms of, of uh, genomic conflicts in a way that uh, while it plays a role in, in the extended phenotype, it is still mostly kind of as a small, here's one small area where the genes of you works really well. But now we know that genomic conflicts are much more common than one, what we did only uh, 30 years ago or so. So I think that will continue to be uh, important, important in our increased understanding of, of genome evolution is to the kind of that not all genes uh, in an organism work for the same goal. And that, I think, is one of the, the major lessons we get from, from, from the genes I view, that we start thinking about why is it that uh, in most organisms, most of the time, genes cooperate. And that kind of is not just with something we take for granted, but something that is there and must be uh, explained, that then under genes I view, we can come up with all these reasons why genes shouldn't uh, cooperate with each other. And this is, goes really nicely where I think that in um, the, uh, the emergence of the, the major transitions uh, research program in, in social evolution, the idea that history of life has been characterized by this uh, transitions in individuality where you have had entities that were previously able to survive and reproduce on their own can now only do so as larger wholes. So, so you have the, mm. the emergence of your cooperation of genes in a genome, you have multiple genomes in, in a eukaryotic cell. So you have the, the nuclear and the mitochondrial genome in, in animals and, and in plants, you also have a chloroplast genome. Um, in in the, the emergence of multicellular organisms, where you have these cells coming together to, to form a new level of individuality. Mm. And then they have individual organisms forming new social groups and, and even 
uh, interaction between multiple between different species in in mutualisms, whether between say plant and pollinators and or between uh, the microbiome and 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 the, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a eukaryotic organism, and you kind of this recognition that at all these levels, whether you're talking about genes and genomes or cells or or individuals, you're faced with the same kind of conceptual problem of what prevents selfish behavior from destroying a common good mm -hmm. that could be achieved from, through cooperation. Uh, again, the genes have is not the only way to to conceptualize that insight, but it, it historically has played an, an important role in recognizing that organisms aren't just, you can't just take them for granted, they are there and they need to be explained how they came to be these cohesive entities. Um, so for me, uh, and here I speak partly from my own biases or, or my own research lies, but kind of understanding how that kind of social interactions with inside of organisms and you can at the uh, very much kind of like the, along the lines of the themes of you, you, you recently interviewed Nicola Raihani, his, his book, The Social Insect, very much deals with this, that the social evolution is, is everywhere. And I think therein lies a really exciting um, future direction of this kind of work. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, I got to say, Arvid, you were uh, so wonderful to, to talk to. I mean, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I read your book um, and, and I was really impressed with just, you know, it, it's got history, it has, you know, biology, it has uh, genetics, it has all these things in it. And it's just really well organized, really well done and very, very balanced way. And so, you know, I'm uh, super privileged to to read a great book and then get to talk to you for three hours about it. And so you, you've been so generous with your time and uh, with, with your energy and your passion. So I, I really appreciate that. Where can... Um, uh, people find you, uh, you know, online, find your work, and where can they get your, your, your book that's out, uh, all, all the good stuff. Uh, so, uh, well, for, 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 first of all, uh, thank you for, for those very uh, kind words. It's been really fun to be uh, part uh, of, of the, uh, the podcast. I've uh, uh, very much enjoyed many previous uh, episodes, so I was very uh, excited to be, to, be, to be part of this. Um, you can, the book was published by uh, Oxford University Press, so it can be ordered through uh, OEP. Uh, it can also be ordered through um, all uh, classic uh, bookstores uh, online, and uh, you can also support your local uh, indie bookshop should, should be able to, to, to get it uh, mm -hmm. directly from, from OEP. Mm -hmm. uh, the, perhaps the best way to, to follow uh, what, am I, what I am uh, up to is on, on, on Twitter, where I can be under the... Uh, at uh, Arvid uh, Agren, in mm -hmm. one word. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Again, uh, Arvid, uh, thank you so much. This really was so much, so much fun. And um, you're always welcome to come on here and talk about whatever you want. So I, uh, this really was uh, uh, a great time. Yeah, no, uh, likewise. I very much appreciate the, the opportunity to, uh, to be here. And I really, uh, really enjoyed uh, our, our, our chat. So yes. uh, this was, uh, was a lot of fun. Yeah, me as well. Thanks so much.